I'm Scott Allen Miller, and this is my giant frequently asked questions relocation edition for Nicaragua 2024. In this video, I'm going to do a bunch of the questions that people ask all the time and try to cover them in one concise video as best as I can. This is kind of an experiment. I'm going to try to do this annually so you can get an updated list of uh, all these questions and see if anything has changed year to year. So we're going to get to your questions about relocation to Nicaragua in 2024. Our number one question, the absolute starter for almost everyone who's looking at relocating or visiting Nicaragua is, in 2024, is Nicaragua safe? And the easy answer is yes. Nicaragua is a very safe country. Of all the places you could visit in the region, Nicaragua ranks at the very top. Its safety is very similar to the U.S., a little bit below Canada. In 2024, it has had a very good track record for the last several years, being actually better than the U.S. and at one moment even better than Canada. So it's in really good company. It is now with El Salvador, ranking as the top in Latin America, definitely the top in Central America. So this is a very safe region. You have no safety concerns beyond the absolute normal that you would have anywhere, right? You have to worry about pickpockets. You have to worry about simple things. If you're going to be living here, you have, of course, people could break into your house and steal things. People will swipe a phone you leave unattended on a table. Those kinds of things are normal, but violent crime is extremely rare. Anything can happen. Of course, always take precautions. Don't be silly with the things that you do. But if you're wondering about a place that is safe, yes, it is safe. And it's in, in fact, quite safe. That's actually a reason that people pick Nicaragua. In fact, it, other than the cost of living, it is probably the absolute top reason why someone should be looking at Nicaragua is that it offers so many great things with such a high degree of safety and comfort and you just don't have to worry and you don't have really dangerous areas mixed in. It's not like, say, the United States where you have large areas that are very safe, but you can accidentally wander into really dangerous ones. Of course, there are areas that can be a little bit more dangerous, but in general, even the worst areas of Nicaragua are nowhere close to what we're used to in some place like the United States. When we talk about like Chicago South Side or East St. Louis, Philadelphia or Baltimore, those areas have places that are so incredibly dangerous. There's nothing like that in Nicaragua. We have a much more even distribution of what little crime there is. And so you can feel pretty safe being everywhere, whether it's a city center or out in the country, a small village or a barrio. And a lot of people mention that they often have fear of going into the barrios or specific barrios because they think that maybe that's where it's not safe. But the reality is, is even the, the vast majority of the barrios are quite safe and it may feel uncomfortable. It may not be a place you want to hang out or maybe it is and it may be a place that you want to live and you shouldn't fear the majority of them uh, just because it is a barrio or it's outside the city center it's not touristy there are very few places that you really should avoid anywhere in the country so safety absolutely it is a safe country don't let that concern you at all and for most people it is the time before you get to nicaragua that is going to be most dangerous <laughs> actually getting to nicaragua is safer for the majority of people is Nicaragua affordable? Yes, absolutely. Whether you're a tourist or an expat looking for a long-term place to live, the cost of living in Nicaragua is extremely good. And this probably goes without saying and isn't the most frequently asked question, but it is an important one. It is something that concerns a lot of people. And this does drive the majority of people to come to Nicaragua when they're looking for a place to live. And that is that your money is just going to go farther, a lot farther. Nicaragua is currently the most affordable of any of the North American or Central American countries, and it ranks competitively with the best of those in South America. Technically, you're going to find some places like Colombia generally squeak in as just a little bit more affordable, but it depends what you want to do. There are different living situations in Colombia and Nicaragua, so it's not always something you can compare directly, but Nicaragua is very, very affordable and ranks at the top of the list for the Western Hemisphere. Of course, you are going to find some places Places abroad, like in Southeast Asia or in Africa, especially East Africa, where you may find a little bit cheaper even still than here in Central America. But for a lot of people, especially coming from North America, once you factor in flights or visas or any complications that come with places that are so much farther away, you generally find that Latin America has a price advantage, even though its day-to-day -day cost of living may be just a little bit more expensive. But when you look at the big picture, the cost of food, the cost of housing, uh, the cost of services and goods and travel to and from, very, very affordable to live in Nicaragua. You can live 
on budgets that are very, very small, often the kind of budgets that Americans or Canadians get with their standard retirement packages from the government, let alone if you have 401ks and so forth. So a lot of people choose uh, this region specifically because it's so affordable and then discover all the great things about it only after they look at, well, where can I afford? So it is a driving factor for the region, but it isn't necessarily the reason that should draw you in. It should just be a really good bonus. But if you're on a really tight budget and you really have to, to tighten your belt as much as possible, Nicaragua could be the most overall cost-effective option for you because of the great safety, because of the proximity to where a lot of our audience would want to come from, US and Canada specifically, because uh, there's so many things that are so easy to deal with, flights are so cheap, should you need to do anything like visit uh, North America from time to time, all those things factor in, and Nicaragua at least has the potential to be the most cost-effective option for you when everything's considered. But day-to-day, -day, it is it is very, very uh, affordable, not just for for the, the staples, but also for going out and doing activities uh, and even visiting neighboring countries, all very easy and affordable. Can you drive in Nicaragua on a U.S. driver's license? Yes, a North American driver's license, U.S. or Canada or Mexico or anywhere else in the Central American zone or Panama all of us share a single licensing system and the licenses from any one of those countries allow you to drive anywhere in any of those countries as long as you are not a resident or citizen of the country that you're switching to in which case then you have to get a local driver's license so meaning here in nicaragua as long as you are a tourist uh you are able to and that is anyone who's not yet obtained official residency you're able to drive on your u.s canadian mexican whatever driver's license without any problem that is the official thing that that you are so that you're able to do um, you do not need an international driver's license all you need is your regular driver's license the international driver's license IDL sometimes called an international driving certificate and other things is a is a translation of your license it is something you have to carry in addition to your license in certain countries like Spain for example but not here in Nicaragua they don't know what it is there's no reason to carry one but it is nice to have one just in case you're gonna travel other places it's nice to have it that you can take with you you don't have to go get one so I, I recommend that you get one but for driving here in Nicaragua, just your North American driver's license is all you need. Do you need a visa to visit Nicaragua? No, if you're coming from North America or Western Europe, you're in a visa-free or automatic visa uh, travel zone to Nicaragua. You're going to be able to come to the border. You don't need to do anything ahead of time. There is some paperwork that they want you to fill out, but I know lots of people who don't do it and they have not been asking for it for a long time. So in 2024, assume you don't have to do anything. If you have a question and you need to get to the border, just go to the border and expect that everything will be fine. But it is supposed to be filled out. So, I mean, it's better if you do it. I wouldn't recommend not doing it, but if you forget it, don't panic, uh, but definitely fill that out online if you can. But that's it. Just come to the border, your U.S., Canadian, European passport. So all you're going to need. If you're not from those regions, then check online. You got to check the, the current status uh, with your embassy as to what is required for Nicaragua. Generally, it's pretty easy, but we do have a lot of people that want to come from Africa. I get asked all the time. They have visa requirements, but you have to check with your embassy in Cairo. There is no way for anyone else, including me, even though I'm here in Nicaragua, there is nothing I can add to the information that they're going to have online for you. They're going to tell you where you can get it, how you can get it, how long you can stay, whatever. But if you're coming from US, Canada, or Europe, you're in great shape, just show up. And that leads us to the next question. How long do I get to stay in Nicaragua on my tourist visa? If you arrive in Nicaragua and you just get the regular visa, the stamp as you cross the border, whether you're coming from Costa Rica, coming in from uh, Mexico or Belize, or you've flown in, you're going to get stamped for 90 days under normal circumstances. Of course, they can stamp you for anything that they want, but the expectation is that you can ask for and receive 90 days. During that 90 days, you are able to apply for an extension. In fact, you're able to apply for three extensions of 30 days each, giving you a total of 180 days. That's a very long time. That's six months here in the country on a tourist visa. Now, that's very standard to get. Lots of people do it. We do it all the time. We have not heard anyone having problems with that. That is the official way for staying a long time. Um, it's, it's very easy to do. So highly recommended. It is simply a 180 day system. They just want to do these extra checks along the way to make sure that you're here in country, that they know where you are. They know how to contact you. They can check that you haven't caused any problems or whatever. So it's very easy. It's very straightforward. So you're even though your stamp at the border is 90 days, your actual time to be able to stay in Nicaragua is 180. Do you need an onward or outbound ticket of some sort when entering Nicaragua? 
No, never when entering Nicaragua do you need to have an onward ticket to another country. A lot of people ask that and that is because they're either confusing it with or assuming it is similar to Costa Rica, which is actually a rarity that, that Costa Rica requires in, at the time you enter their country that you already have your ticket back out of the country. The idea that you will show up in Costa Rica and stay indefinitely is not something that they generally allow. They're very not into that. But Nicaragua wants you to stay. They want you to come for a short period of time, discover that you love it, and stay a lot longer than you originally expected. And that's the normal way that things happen in Nicaragua. So it's a really good system. So when you show up at the border, whether it's the land border or you're flying in the airport, no one is ever going to ask you for an onward ticket. That doesn't mean that some agencies won't try to scam you, but that is not Nicaragua that is making that requirement. We have heard of some airlines that illegally falsify that information and demand that you purchase a ticket, presumably from them, in order to have them allow you on the plane. This is a scam. They are trying to raise money by forcibly either selling you a ticket that you didn't want or reselling a seat that they've already sold to you so they can sell it to someone else. In every case, it is an illegal scam, but you need to check with your local country as to what your flight protections are. That is not something I can advise you on other than it is definitely falsified. There is never a case that you need that in Nicaragua. There are lots of uh, airlines especially that do this. It is completely fake and you normally have pretty strong legal recourse, but probably not at the time. You'll need to be able to buy a ticket, but this could happen anywhere, right? They could claim the same thing about the U.S., about Canada. If they're just going to falsify information, they're just going to falsify information. They tend to do it a little bit more with Nicaragua because a lot of people are like, oh, I didn't know. I don't know how to look it up. I don't know where to check. I don't know what my recourses are. And they have a hard time finding the resources in Nicaragua to prove that they don't need it so that they can go back and say the airlines made this up. But it it is a real scam that they run. So just be aware, Nicaragua absolutely does not have that requirement. They never have, but we know lots of people who have been scammed for it. Some people have managed to, you know, get a manager and show documentation, bring up the law and, and finally get allowed on the plane, but not always. A lot of times people just buy tickets and suck it up. So that really goes a long way of just determining how good of an airline you're choosing. Uh, so just be aware that that is something you, you may have to deal with depending on where you're flying into or, or which airlines you're taking. But here in Nicaragua, absolutely not needed. Now, that doesn't mean that there's never a situation that you will need an onward ticket, but it is never needed when you're entering the country. This is just an important uh, aside. If you're staying for the full 180 days, that means you've done 90 days from your stamp over the border, you extend by 30, which takes you up to 120. You extend by 30 again, which takes you up to 150. Generally, but not always, but there is a very real possibility at your 150 days, if you're going to extend to the final 180, the last 30 days, at that point, they have at times required that you have an outbound ticket within that 30 day period. It could be the 30th day, it could be 29th day, it could be the second day, doesn't matter. Just sometime during that 30 days, they wanna know that you have paid for an outbound ticket and they know you will be exiting the country and then they don't have to worry that you get to the end and don't have a way out, right? But that is the only time, as long as you're at the 150, I have never heard of anyone being asked to provide any evidence of leaving the country because they don't expect you to during that time. They're hoping you stay to the 180, but at the very, very last time, they might. Now, we know when you renewed a bit, typically they don't ask for it. They know you're going to exit. They know you're able to come in. It Typically, if you're staying for a while, that's more than the 180 days, you know, one year, two year, three years, typically they get to know you pretty well and they know your situation and they don't really have to look as much into you to say, are you going to be able to leave the country and come back? Will Costa Rica accept you? They know Costa Rica is going to accept you. They know that they accepted you six months ago. They'll take you again, that kind of thing. So it, it the mileage will vary depending on your situation, but assume that you may have to produce that at that time. So don't be surprised by it. Don't give yourself absolutely no time to come up with a ticket. Go and try to extend and then find out that you don't have time to extend and you don't have time to get a ticket. That could be where you run into a problem. So just something to be aware of. But when entering the country, you never need an onward ticket. Can you do border runs to extend your stay in Nicaragua? Yes, absolutely. Nicaragua is a pro-border run country. Not only do they allow it, but they more or less promote it. The system is this. When you're staying in Nicaragua, whether you're within your first 90 days or sometime within your longer 180 with the additional extensions, all you have to do is step into a hard border transition, go into the next country and return, and you start the process over again. That means you get a 90-day stamp with a total of 180-day possibility when you re-enter the country. 
but we're going to talk about in the next question where those countries are, where those borders are. But it's important that you understand that it is a hard border, not a soft border. Nicaragua is a country that has soft borders, and so you need to be very conscious of where they are. But as long as you're going over the hard border, and you may do this anytime that you're staying in Nicaragua, you may decide to visit a country that is crossed by a hard border. You can do that by land or by plane, or in theory by boat, but I don't know where you would go. Uh, <laughs> and when you do that, uh, you leave the country when you re-enter. At any time that you re-enter, it starts the clock over again. And a lot of people wonder, how long can you stay out of the country when doing a border run? Or how long do you need to stay out of the country to do the border run? And to the best of my knowledge, there is no official number on this. We've never heard any problem of anyone coming back in immediately. The maximum you could ever reasonably be asked to stay out is 72 hours. So we recommend that you just get a hotel room or be prepared to get a hotel room somewhere, spend a few nights, really not a big deal. But we've never heard of any anyone actually being required to do this. It's more of a safety that we all recommend because we we all kind of have this gut feeling like maybe it could happen at some point. Maybe there's some rule that no one's aware of and technically they could make you stay out longer, but we're not actually familiar with it nor of it happening. And I've talked to a lot of people. Everyone I know does this all the time. It is such a standard thing for expats who are living here that the border runs are just a normal part of everyday life. They are not a big deal. A lot of people, we have a lot of videos on this, right? Every single topic that we're covering here has a video on it, but we're doing this facts so that we can get a whole bunch of them together at once. You can kind of run through a bunch of stuff. But if this video shows you that Nicaragua has a lot of potential for you, dig into the other videos we have so that you're able to go explore all these topics in depth, get more information. But we do want to do this fact annually because a lot of these things come up with, well, in 2023, you said I could do a border run, but now people are telling me in 2024 I can't. So is that current? That's why we want to do this. We can say, yes, this is current. We're, we're in March of 2024. We're able to say, yeah, this is, this is what we're doing right now on the ground here in Nicaragua. So a lot of times that information, when people say that stuff, well, in 2024, it's, it's, they're just, you're getting information that's many years out of date and someone's just saying it in 2024. Often when I hear stories of people, you know, oh, well, you have this problem or that problem. You're like, really? When's the last time that happened to you? Uh, I don't know, 2008 or so. Okay, we're talking about right now, right? People want to know what the border current policy is, not what, what it was a long time ago. So border runs, completely acceptable, and assume you can just go over the border and back out, but always have a plan just in case you need to stay out for three days. And it's not such a big deal. All of the countries you could go to as a hard border run are very nice places to potentially spend a little bit of time, so not a big deal. What is the CA for, and where are Nicaragua's hard borders? In our last question, we said if you want to reset your visa, you, your tourist visa, you need to step over one of the hard borders, enter the bordering country, and re-enter Nicaragua. You can't go, some people asked if you can go out of Nicaragua and not enter the other country. No, you definitely cannot do that. That is not a border run. The term border run does not mean that. A border run means you cross into another country, not just out of Nicaragua. Like, it's got to be both. Otherwise, people would just go out into the water and come right back and be like, what? I reset in, at sea. It doesn't work that way. No, you have to be, you have to make it through border control of another country and then back in through border control of Nicaragua. But which ones are the hard borders? So Nicaragua is part of a border zone known as the CA4 or the Central America 4. Before anyone calls it an explosive C4, that is not its name, it is Central America 4, CA4. The CA4 are the tightly integrated four northern uh, Central American countries that used to be members of the Central American Federation together and have a lot of shared history, politics, uh, um, economies and everything. They're, they're tightly integrated. The northern three are the old Mayan uh, homeland and are known as the Northern Triangle. That is Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. They share a really strong cultural bond and a really strong historic bond. They used to have another uh, member of their group known as Los Altos to the north, but that member decided it didn't want to be part of the Central American political entity anymore and joined Mexico and is now part of the Mexican state of Chiapas. So they still exist, they still have a capital, but they're, uh, the majority of that country uh, is now part of Mexico. Some small part of that country was absorbed into Guatemala. They split it with, I think, about two-thirds of the land went to Mexico and the traditional capital, Shela, uh, or Quetzaltenango, went into Guatemala. So that region, that Mayan four-state region, sits to the north. And Nicaragua, which is the largest of all the countries in the CA4, sits just to the south and is not a traditional Mayan region. It is the uh, Nicaragua region here, uh, but they have a very long history all tied together. So we kind of identify the northern three as the northern triangle and Nicaragua kind of stands on its own, but the four of them together are the tight long-term Central American partnership. 
Traditionally, long time ago, Costa Rica was also part of that, and we sometimes refer to the group plus them as the CA5. This is not all the countries of Central America, but it's all the ones that see themselves as Central American by culture. Belize is also part of Central America, but is not part of the Federation of Central America, and Costa Rica was. So, a little bit of history there. So, what that means is that borders between Nicaragua, El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala are soft. You don't go through a full border transition when you move between those countries. That's really nice if you live here full time and you have a car and you want to just drive around, you can move pretty easily between those countries. There isn't this strong uh, border control process. And in some cases, there's like nothing. You can just drive right in at times. It depends on which country to which country, exactly how much of a control system they do have. And sometimes they stamp your passport. Sometimes they don't, but they don't have to. It's advised that they do so that you know that they know that you're there or whatever. But it, it's a pretty easy process throughout the region. So that means for Nicaraguans, if you want to reset your passport, you have to go over one of the borders that is not those. That makes to the north your nearest border pretty far away. Your northern borders that are hard are the Mexican and Belizean borders. That's a very long drive from Nicaragua, but if you like doing a long drive, perfect. It's a beautiful place to go to, right? So you have a lot of great options. It's just a really long road trip. But if you want to do it by bus or something like that, or by flight to those regions, absolutely you can do that. And that will reset your passport, your visa for your passport. But most people want to do it quickly and easily. And that's what they're looking for. And the one option that is quick and easy is to cross the border into Costa Rica. That to the south is only a few hours away for the majority of Nicaraguans, no matter where you live in the country, you can get to Costa Rica within a reasonable amount of time. Uh, and they are very easy to get into. If you're from a North American or European country, uh, the, the passports let you right into Costa Rica. Very simple. You can go right in, turn around, come right back into Nicaragua and your, your passport has reset. Importantly, in case it wasn't obvious from this, that means that your tourist visa here in Nicaragua is shared with the other three countries in the CA4, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, and then, of course, Nicaragua. That means if you get 90 days coming in at Guatemala, you still have to, you, you're using the same time. Your your 180 day total is used within that zone. You can't move to, to Honduras and be like, I get another 180 days. No, you can't go to El Salvador and be like, I'm continuing my vacation. Generally, this isn't a problem. But if you enter at Guatemala or Nicaragua and you plan on doing a lot of time traveling in these four countries and you don't plan to leave them anytime soon, it's actually not so hard to split four countries over six months and realize you may have stayed over six months between those four countries. There's no way to extend past 180 days without leaving that zone. So you just want to think about, you know, if you enter Guatemala on January 1st, by the middle of the year, you got to be out of Nicaragua on the other side and onto Costa Rica. You only have to step out, come right back in. It's just easy to not visualize the fact that you've been in a zone for that long. It works essentially the same as the Schengen in Europe. They don't allow border runs, but the idea that you enter at any one of the Schengen countries and you can move throughout the region and you get 90 days within the entire region before you have to leave is something people are used to when dealing with Europe. It's just doing the same thing and realizing that the CA4 operates like the European Schengen zone. And once you get that, then it's like, okay, this is pretty straightforward. It's not a big deal. And it's very easy to deal with. It's just important to keep in mind that your 180 days refers to your time in the entire CA4 Central American zone and not to your time in Nicaragua specifically, even though you may be thinking of it as just Nicaragua when you come in. For example, that's what really throws people off is they think I get 180 days in Nicaragua, they move on to Honduras and they forget that they're still on the same 180 day pool that's been ticking down since they first got into Nicaragua. People will tell them in Honduras, we get 180 days in Honduras and you think, oh, I'm great. Well, no, they mean in the zone, not just in Honduras. Can I get a job when I come to Nicaragua? A lot of people, when you're looking at coming to Nicaragua or anywhere, especially if you're looking at becoming an expat, may be looking for local employment. And this makes sense. You want a way to support yourself while you're traveling or living abroad. You want to make a permanent move. And you, wherever you've lived previously, you worked. So when you're moving to a new place, you want to work too. Well, the answer is simple. No, under essentially no reasonable circumstances whatsoever will you be allowed to work in Nicaragua. That is off the table. 
don't even think about it. Don't ask about it. Don't look into it. It's not going to happen. It is not something that is available. Nicaragua has very high unemployment at this time, and they are very protective of all the jobs that are done in the country need to be done by Nicaraguans. And this makes a lot of sense. When you have very high unemployment, the government is looking out for the people and doesn't want, which could be a massive swarm of outsiders coming in and taking all the jobs. The idea is that if you're going to be a tourist, obviously you don't want to work here. If you're looking for some form of residency, whether it's just kind of saying residency and being here for a long term on a tourist visa, or you actually want to file for residency, however you want to do it, the idea is that you're coming and bringing value to the country, not coming and taking jobs away. So there's a lot of potential for you to come and be a great participant in the economy, but needing a local job, which will always come at the expense of a Nicaraguan who is no longer able to do that job because you've taken their spot, is not something that they're going to allow. Someday, maybe they will when unemployment has gone away and there's not enough people to fill the jobs. Of course, they're going to change those policies. But right now, unemployment is the number one thing crippling the country. And so that is the thing that they are certainly not going to allow people to come in and take advantage of, especially because it would take very little for other countries, which are much larger, to flood the market with people looking for jobs and make it essentially impossible for Nicaragua to support its own economy. So that's something they're very protective of for really good reasons. Now, that does not mean you can't come here and work. If you're coming down as a digital nomad and you're going to work abroad, if you're an investor abroad and you're just bringing in your investment dollars, if you're a manager and you're managing people from afar, if you're a digital worker and you're working for a company uh, and you're, you're sitting in your hotel room and doing work or you rent an apartment here and you do work any of those things, you're golden. You're completely allowed to work as a digital nomad or a remote worker, however you want to classify yourself, as long as your base of work is outside Nicaragua and you are working remotely at it, and you are in Nicaragua doing the work, you're completely set. Nicaragua does not tax you, they do not require anything of you, they don't classify you as a worker, you are set. A lot of countries have digital nomad visas specifically for this purpose, and they put a lot of restrictions on you when you're working that way, but Nicaragua does not. The idea of being a digital nomad has always been something that they completely promote under their normal tourist visa. So whether you're just popping in over the border for 90 days, you're bringing your laptop with you and you decide to do some work, Technically, in a lot of countries, you're not supposed to do that. Canada will check you if you're going just for a two-day weekend. If you bring your laptop and they say, what's the laptop for? You say, oh, you know, in case work needs me, boom, you could be denied entry just for that. Uh, I know my business partner from here once went to Canada for two days, brought his laptop, and they let him go and said if they ever caught him coming in with a laptop again, he would be banned from the country. That's how seriously Canada takes a you may not vacation and do any work in Canada. Technically, if you check your email for your office while in Canada, technically it's illegal and they have the option of kicking you out, of deporting you over that. They're not likely to in this day and age, but it was in this day and age that having a laptop with you was a major problem. So yeah, if you're bringing a laptop because you want to check in with the family, you want to book your tickets, you want to play video games online and not miss your midnight wordle with your kids, great, no problem. Canada doesn't care that you have the laptop, but they do care that you might do some of your remote work while visiting. So Canada is specifically a tourist destination most working people want to avoid the very idea that you could be completely severed from work, especially if you're an entrepreneur or an investor and you need to do anything to just check up on your business. I recommend just taking Canada off of your travel list. That's an extreme example in the one way, Nicaragua's extreme in the other. They would say to all those people, please bring your laptops here, set up in a cafe and work to your heart's content. Bring in as much money as you possibly can and spend it in our beautiful country by spending it on coffee and hotel rooms and volcano surfing tours and all that kind of stuff. It's a very logical approach. Uh, Canada has very different needs, so it's kind of logical that they're not allowing it. I don't think it's logical that they're as extreme as they are, but uh, you know, they do what they want to do. But here you can absolutely, digital nomadry is 100%. If they ask you, why is your laptop here? Oh, because I'm going to do some remote work should cause no problems at all because you're totally allowed to do that on the tourist visa. You can then, of course, stay and get a residencia if you want, and you can continue to work on that as well. That won't change just because you stop being a tourist. You have lots of options, but being able to work remotely, bring in money, and support the economy is 100% not just allowed, but requested. That is what Nicaragua is hoping for in people coming to the country. Who can buy a house in Nicaragua? We'll include rentals in this as well. So you want to rent or you want to buy land, a house, 
uh, a business of some sort. It could be a warehouse, it could be a factory, anything like that. Physical real estate, uh, anything of the sort, or you want to rent it. It could be an apartment, a condo, anything like that. Who is eligible to make these kinds of transactions? I lump them all together because everyone is eligible for all of it. It's actually that simple. You do not have to be present in Nicaragua. You do not have to have ever visited Nicaragua. You do not have to have a current tourist visa. You do not need to be resident. You certainly don't need to be a citizen. Anybody from anywhere in the world can right now decide to invest in Nicaragua. And maybe you should, that could be a great investment. But buying land or a standing house or a business is open to everyone, of course, good sensible practice says it's probably best to be in the country and know what you're buying you need to be here to evaluate things like don't be silly but it doesn't matter who you are you have the right to engage in property transactions here in nicaragua there are a few very limited limitations such as there's a small stretch along Costa Rica and Honduran borders where foreigners are not allowed to own a home right up against the border without permission from the government. But it's only without permission of the government. I'm sure if you have a legitimate reason to want to be in that zone, it's probably personal opinion, not hard to get. But those are the only limitations. You want to own on the beach, no problem. Foreigners are allowed to own waterfront properties, water view properties. You're allowed to own any place that a Nicaraguan is allowed to own, you're allowed to own. There would be exceptions for places where Nicaraguans in general are restricted from owning and only say indigenous communities are allowed to continue living because they've been there traditionally and they want to otherwise keep the land as a preserve or use for some government purpose. So those things, but you'd have the same restrictions that other Nicaraguans would have, not specific uh, restrictions because you're a foreigner. So it really is open to everyone. And that includes all the different types of ownership. We have a deep video that goes into this, but you can get a traditional deed. You can get what's known as a real, which is a deed that is issued from the King of Spain long ago. They're, they're the most sought after type of land purchase available. Or there are some very specific indigenous areas along the beaches, which are uh, leased land. And it's not like a traditional lease. It's actually a very desirable type of land ownership, but it is a different structure. It has different taxes. It has a different mechanism. You need to know about it if you're going to look at that. But it's certainly uh, available to foreigners, the same as anyone else. And we've got videos that cover all of that. So it's that simple. You can own land. I don't care who you are. If you're watching this video, you have the right to purchase property, land, house, condo, business, whatever, here in Nicaragua. What's the exchange rate from the Nicaraguan Cordoba to the US dollar? Nicaragua has its own currency known as the Cordoba, and it's very simple. In 2024, it is 37 Cordoba to the US dollar. The exchange rates on the international market will vary just the tiniest bit, but with any reasonable amount of rounding, 37 is what you come out to, and that is what you work from in your head. Here in Nicaragua, businesses will take both dollars and Cordobas essentially transparently. There are a few limited businesses who only want to work in one or the other, but most transactions can happen in either. The majority of people work in Cordoba. The only time you really see dollars a lot is when you're dealing with things like rent or car payments, things that are exceptionally large and often to businesses that have to bring in products from the outside doing importations. Often they want to do those in dollars. So getting dollars for them can be beneficial, but most of the banks here operate bank accounts in both currencies. You just have to choose which one you're going to do when you open your bank account and uh, you can work in either. Most like restaurants and, and normal shops will simply give you the price in either and it's 37 to 1 and just pick the one that makes sense for you. Because they do this, they can't give one as a better price than the other or people would start using whatever currency it is to get the better price because we all know the exchange rate. So we would game the system if, if they did that. Uh, but they really don't. Um, if you're doing things, you know, if you ask for it in a currency that they've not handled, that could cause problems because now you're pushing them to do in their head uh, math. And of course, if you're dealing with really small amounts, it's 37 Cordoba to the dollar. We do not have pennies here. There's no way to break a dollar bill. So if you are paying for things that are in a small denomination, you can get really granular with Cordoba. For example, if a product costs 30 Cordoba and you want to pay in dollars, you're going to pay a dollar, but you're going to throw away seven Cordoba on that. Now, that's not a big deal. And if it's only happening one time, you don't care because you're literally talking about a small number of cents. But if you are doing this every day, it's going to add up over time. That 
little tiny tax could end up being a 20% tax on your overall cost of living. And that's just that type of transaction. I've seen people make this mistake and pay 92% over the rate that they needed to simply because they made someone do a weird uh, uh, currency translation. Now, again, it was just a small object. If you're paying your rent and you're paying in Cordoba versus dollars, the most you can be off is $1. So it doesn't make a big difference on the amount of rent. However, rent is so low here that there is a chance that you're off by an entire dollar. That can be greater than 1% of your rent. Unlikely, it's more likely to be half to a quarter of a percent, but there are certainly houses, not apartments, that rent for well under $100. Probably not ones that expats are going to be looking for, but they could be if you're on a super tight budget and doing things like trying to work in dollars instead of Cordoba could end up, if they're working in Cordoba and, and you're rounding that extra dollar, you could end up losing one and a half percent on your on your rent every month simply because you're using the wrong currency. So I encourage you to pay attention, do it smartly, and probably use Cordoba's whenever possible, and that will help you quite a bit. If I need to exchange money, where do I go to do that? So here in Nicaragua, this is very straightforward. In front of most banks, especially in the cities, there are money changers standing on the street. These people are official and they give you the best rates in the country. They get their money from the banks and they do it in large bulk transactions, which gives them the best rates and then they pass it on to you. That is their job standing on the street. They are not hustlers. They are not there doing it on the side. This is their actual career and they are generally respected members of the community. They know the exchange rates and they do exchanges all day long because businesses here need to work in dollars, Cordoba, euros, Canadian dollars, and several other things on a regular basis. And so they're an important part of international business in a small country where bank lines can be extremely long. The banks need to do this because they use it to reduce how long the weights of the banks are. And normal Nicaraguans do it because it allows them to get money exchanged in a matter of minutes, whereas going to the bank can take more than an hour. So in many cases, it's really beneficial to everyone. Everyone wins with the system. And it's really handy that you can just walk up outside a bank and be like, oh, I've got X amount of dollars. Can I get quarter bond? There's like, here you go. Boom. Good. Good to go. Now, of course, most of the time, you don't want to be changing dollars back and forth. That is a limited activity for most people, but should you need to do it, the option is there. How do I access my money when I'm in Nicaragua? Whether you're a tourist or you're staying here for a really long time, getting money from bank accounts abroad is generally pretty simple. Most countries participate in the general system that allows you to use ATM systems anywhere in the world. And of course, it depends on your bank. It depends on your country. And there are situations, especially with Canadians, where they want to get away from Canadian banking for tax reasons. But in general, as long as you're in Nicaragua and your money is somewhere abroad, you can go to the ATM and just take it out, especially if you're coming from the United States. Nicaraguan ATMs dispense universally both dollars and Cordoba. I generally recommend getting Cordoba, but if you need dollars for some reason, you can go and get those no problem. Every major bank has them. Every major ATM has them. They do run out from time to time, but they do offer it. So that is the easiest thing to do. And for most people, that is the mechanism you want to use. Keep things as simple as possible. Don't carry unnecessarily large amounts of cash and just use the ATMs. Keep your money in North America or Europe or wherever you're coming from, unless you have a specific problem that doesn't allow you to do that. And if your bank abroad doesn't give you the option for that, look around. You probably can find one in your own country. And if you need to, using something like a Swiss bank account uh, tends to be available for people who are willing to go through a little bit of extra effort. And then those will work anywhere in the world. And I know people from the United States that do that, but I'm an American and I have really good access to all of my banks in the United States here. Uh, it's no problem at all. And for most of us, keeping banks in our home country is not a problem. Canadians seem to be an exception to that. Uh, I don't know exactly how those rules work, but many Canadians have talked to me about they do. There's a bunch of things that don't really make general sense that they do here and it's because they're looking to stay here long term and because they're Canadian. Canada just has a whole bunch of really onerous requirements on them to keep from being taxed as if they're still in Canada. And so they may be making decisions based on the Canadianness of their decisions, not on the Nicaragua side of things. Can I get citizenship and get a Nicaraguan passport? So unless you have extenuating circumstances, such as you are born to Nicaraguan parents, you were actually born in Nicaragua and just haven't taken the time to get your passport or something like that, the answer is a resounding no. Citizenship in Nicaragua is highly restricted and very unlikely that you are going to qualify for it, even if you put in decades of living here in the country. It is not absolutely impossible. There is a path to it, and if you really want to do it, 
feel free to give it a try. I don't want to rule it out for people who truly want it and are just so disenchanted that they're not able to. It does exist as a possibility. And if your goal is to become a Nicaraguan and raise your children as Nicaraguans, well, you may be able to pull it off, but it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of planning. And you're going to want to make sure you talk to lawyers early on and do a lot of things throughout your life to make sure you're always moving towards that path. And it's a very risky thing to do because the time period necessary to go through the likely process of it means that the government may change several times during that process and you may end up at a time where uh, you finally would have qualified under old rules and those rules may not exist anymore. By and large, simply assume that citizenship is not an option. What about residency options here in Nicaragua? Now, Nicaragua may not be easy to get a passport, but residency is very simple. It is a residency country. Everything about visiting Nicaragua is designed around the idea that you will be a tourist for quite some time, and when you're done being a tourist, you'll become a resident if you decide to stay. This works out really well for a lot of people and makes Nicaragua specifically attractive because so many other countries focus on their citizenship requirements, and that's where they really put their, their investment as a as an expat location and that can be great for people who really need another passport but for a lot of north americans and europeans they don't necessarily really feel a need to have a secondary passport they just want to be able to live abroad and have a different tax base or a lower cost of living or maybe just healthier food or a safer environment whatever it is you're looking for you may find it here in nicaragua and you probably don't need citizenship to get the thing that you're looking for. Specifically, if you just need a secondary passport, Nicaragua is not going to be a good option for you, both because it's so hard to get that passport and because the passport is not a very good one. It's unfortunate, but that is not something that Nicaragua really controls. So what people are often looking for here when they come to Nicaragua is residency. And what does residency give you? In general, not a lot. And this is important. People shouldn't be looking for residency as a goal. Your goal is to be able to stay in the country. That there is a mechanism called residency is kind of unimportant in the grander scheme of things. What does matter is that you come in as a tourist and you can stay, as you know, for 180 days, that's six months, and you can renew that by simply stepping over the border and coming right back in. Well, that gets you up to a year. Do that two or three times. You're at a couple of years. At some point, you may say, well, shouldn't I be a resident? And the answer is yes. At some point, you should. And when is that? It depends. This is where it gets a little bit fuzzy the government will generally tell you. And it's as simple as at some point you'll be here, you'll want to renew, and they'll say, you need to consider residency. And I know some people from certain Asian countries have gotten it as quickly as six months. They were here and told they needed to apply for residency. But I also know uh, many other people have been here for a number of years, and it takes quite a while before they get told they need residency. So it's, it's kind of a moving thing based on your depending on your situation how you've traveled have you never left the country at all do you really go in and out quite a bit and you're not here that much like all kinds of things will factor in i'm sure and that changes quite a bit over time the only answer i can really give you is that is something that you have to start you have to come in do your tourism system and just you know always be thinking about do i want residency is that something i want to do when the time comes and when the government says hey i think it's time for you to stop doing border runs and start becoming a resident you go either okay i'm going to move on to another country this is my last update or you start your residency process what does residency actually give you other than the ability to stay after they said you've worn out your tourism welcome well in general not very much there's a reason why you shouldn't be looking for it until they tell you you need it because the only really major benefit is that you are able to buy a car in your own name you can buy a car by having a business you can drive a car you can rent a car but you can't order you can't own a car in your own name which of course what owning a car means, but it's surprising how many people say, well, can't you have someone else own the car? Yes, that is not you owning a car, uh, but if you want to own a car and it's you, not your company, then you have to be a resident in order to do that. And the advantage to owning a car in your own name versus having a company own it or just borrowing someone else's is that when it's in your name, you're able to cross the soft borders into Honduras, El Salvador, or Guatemala. You can just drive through a larger region. You can also take it over the hard borders, but you're still doing the import process. But within the CA4, you're able to drive around more or less transparently because you're within a border and it's your car businesses don't go over borders even soft ones so a business owned car can't leave nicaragua because it would stop having an owner and that would cause paperwork problems so you have to be a personal owner of a car that is the big thing residency comes in a couple different flavors so which one you would want to go for when the time comes will depend on your situation in a lot of different ways but there are options and most people are able to qualify without too much effort of course it's good to get a lawyer ahead of time be prepared so that when the question does come up you are ready 
but that's about all you really need to do and almost everyone is going to be fine finding a way to do it. What are my options for residency in Nicaragua? There's the obvious option for nearly everyone. If you decide to move to Nicaragua and marry a Nicaraguan, you will get residency automatically. This can be shocking to people from, say, places like the United States, where marrying an, an American often can lead to not being able to get residency or may make the process more difficult. It's surprisingly hard for someone to become resident in the United States, and marriage is not a useful tool for moving in that direction. Something that a lot of Americans assume that people will you know, marry Americans for a green card, but it doesn't work that way at all. It is the farthest thing from reality. And I know Americans who are married to people from other countries and those people don't even get the right to visit the United States, let alone live there because it's so difficult uh, to get a visa, even as a married couple. And I knew uh, when my company got started 25 years ago, my business partner uh, married a Canadian and it took years of planning before they could get married. They had to get married in a very specific time frame and in a very specific way and in a very specific place, all for the United States to recognize the situation and give them a path over a period of years for her to, to immigrate to the United States. It was extremely difficult. Even for Canadians to come to the United States, it's extremely difficult. So you can imagine just in general, it's a complicated process. So Americans are often surprised when they learn that marrying in Nicaragua means you get to stay, period, just done, as long as you stay married. If you stop being married, then suddenly that residency evaporates and you need to find another form of residency. That's not a big deal. There are other forms of residency for you. So the next type is what we call the retirement residency. And in the past, we've referred to this only as the retirement or pension residency. This is the traditional type of residency where you are a retiree. This is where you want to spend your, your twilight years and you have a pension from a 401k or something in the United States. Technically, a 401k is not a pension. So sometimes they're, they're able to look at that in one way and sometimes they have to look at it in another but you come in with a fixed income from the United States, and I have a bug climbing into my ear, that's great, and uh, uh, you qualify with a certain amount of money and you're not a criminal or whatever, and, and they let you stay based on that. That is a one-year residency process, and every year you have to go through it again and show that you have met the requirements and continue to meet the requirements. And it's not a big deal to re-up. Uh, it's meant for that system to work that way. It's just something you have to do annually. But So it's not the most fluid process because, you, uh, because you're based on that fixed income. They want to ensure that you're still on that fixed income, and so it goes year to year, and you constantly have to uh, prove yourself, which is fine, but it is a little bit of effort. There is a matching remote worker residency, and I don't know its exact name, but it basically it's been created more recently, and it matches the retirement or the pensione uh, residency almost identically, but it's designed so that they have the tools for migración or the immigration office to be able to look at traditional income rather than pension income uh, to, to qualify people. Now, they always had ways to do it in the past, but it was a lot more complicated. So this makes it more clear that people who are younger, because the, the retirement one re requires that you're over the age of 45 and requires that you have this fixed income of a certain type, you can make an argument that you beat that requirement in some other way, but there's this other type that I don't know its name, uh, it's, its official name, but it's this working digital nomad type residency where um, you simply have to show that you have a certain type of income and you don't have to be 45 years old, and, and then you can qualify through that means. And then there's the famous type of residency, and, and that one has the same requirements, the same one year re-up and everything. Then you have the investment residency. This is where you bring in large sums of money and you invest it in real functional employing businesses in Nicaragua. It, there's no skirting this. The requirements are incredibly tough. You have to have a functional business. You have to be employing people. You have to be paying your business taxes. You have to be paying your employer taxes. You have all the, they have to be paying their taxes as employees. Um, you have to show that you're really trying to run it as a business. You will be inspected. It is a very very heavyweight process, but this gives you a five-year residency window before you have to prove it again. But at the end of the five years, they expect more investment. They expect you to be growing, to employ more people. So you can't just start a business and then wind it down be like, okay, I did it, it failed, and now I'm just doing my thing. You have to continuously be being a business person in Nicaragua who's continuously investing and growing. You don't have to make the base requirements necessarily every five years. Of course, in half a decade from now, who knows what the requirements will be? but it is designed for people who are honestly looking to fund and grow businesses in Nicaragua. And that, if that's truly what you're doing, it is not really a problem to hit the requirements unless you're looking to do so on just too small of a scale. And if that's the case, well, it's 
that's fine. They don't care that you're too small. You'll just have to qualify for your residency through some other process. Uh, you won't be able to do it through investment, but that doesn't mean you can't do a small scale investment. If your goal is to, you know, be able to retire, but you also want to invest in a hot dog cart that will not make anywhere near the amount of money required for the investment. That's fine. You're totally allowed to own a business. You're totally allowed to invest. You're totally allowed to do all those entrepreneurial things. It just won't count for that type of, uh, of residency. So not a problem, but if you're really doing it, if you're putting in the money, you're truly a business person and you're really trying to make the effort to do what it takes to be a viable business, then you will have no problems, right? Every person who has problems with this is because they're either trying to run a business that is somehow skirting the law. They're trying to not pay taxes. They're trying to do the work themselves instead of hiring people like they're supposed to do one way or another. They're doing something that doesn't qualify as investment. None of those things are investing. All those things are actually anti-investing to some degree. So they really want the purpose of the investment system is to cause you to be employing and creating jobs. The whole point is creating jobs in the communities that you come into. So if that's the thing you're doing, if you're making a positive impact on the country economically through your business activities, then you should be without a problem as long as you hit the minimum thresholds. And that's just a matter of looking up what they are for that year, for the number of people you are, and, and what qualifies for you. You do need to jump through some hoops on that. You need to make sure that the government approves your business before you do it, or you risk having started a business that doesn't qualify. Not every business does. Most do. It's not generally a problem. I don't know anyone who's ever been rejected because they did the wrong type of business, but just to cross your T's and dot your I's, make sure that you do it uh, and get it checked ahead, ahead of time. Work with a lawyer and make sure you're doing everything by the book as you're supposed to do it so that you don't have to adjust things later or put more in or do it again in order to qualify. The other question that goes along with this is, well, I've heard from so many places, can I just buy a house to qualify as an investment? No, houses are not a business and they in no way qualify as an investment portion of your residency process. The country will love for you to buy a house that's not a negative in any way. They're not telling you not to do that. It simply doesn't qualify as a place to put your money for your business investment. They know that real estate is simply something you can buy and sell. It doesn't mean that you're actually making an investment in the country and uh, it doesn't actually tie you to anything and it doesn't cause you to pay taxes. So while they love that people are investing in, in houses or real estate or farms or whatever, it is the actual business investment that they are concerned about, not houses. And I know a lot of places that sell houses or get paid for helping you buy a house push the idea that you can use houses for residency. And there was a time long ago when that was a standard way to get residency, when they were really trying to get residents in as fast as possible. But they're not trying to do that now and they no longer accept that as a residency path. So anyone who's who's telling you that in 2024, no, that is that is not how it works. Can I bring such and such a camera into Nicaragua? Yes, cameras are completely allowed. You will have no problem bringing any type of camera, tripod, light, or any other studio accoutrement. And no, it doesn't matter if it's a pocket camera or your phone or tripods or a big DSLR or cinema equipment. All of it is allowed in Nicaragua. There was specifically in 2023, a new executive order passed to make sure that it was clear that border control did not have the right, it was not authorized to stop the movement of or to tax the movement of camera and recording equipment, including binoculars into the country, specifically for the reason that tourism benefits when more people see more of the beautiful country. And so that is specifically protected. There was a brief 12 hour period in which they announced they were going to be restricting some cameras, not restricting, simply taxing them based on certain characteristics, basically saying anything that Netflix approved for their cinema list was going to be taxed as cinema equipment. And that made it about 12 hours before the executive office stepped in and said, this is really silly. This is going to make people panic and not want to come here. And what we want is not only for people to come, but for them to bring their cameras and show people what it looks like here. So all that kind of stuff is protected. And trust me, I test this regularly. I have uh, at least five cameras that would have violated the, the rules during that 12 hour period. I have lots of lenses for them. I have multiple studio lights. I have multiple eight tripods, who knows? I have a lot of equipment, including a commercial broadcast board. None of it got a second look. So all that stuff is absolutely fine. And I have 360 cameras. I have all kinds of specialty stuff, big cameras, tiny cameras. I have really tested the water. I don't have anything that's, you know, I don't have an airy or anything like that, but I have really good cameras and, and I come in with loads of lenses and stuff. And people always ask about half the shipment sizes that I have. Well, can I bring this camera? Yes, absolutely. I bring in audio recorders, microphones, cables, 
all that stuff, batteries, all that stuff, no problem at all. And then everyone asks, can I bring in a drone? No, drones are completely forbidden to cross the border here into Nicaragua. That doesn't mean that there aren't people sneaking them in, there obviously are, but any drone that is in the country could be seized or simply shot down. They have no obligation to give it back to you. They probably won't even try to figure out who the owner is. They'll just destroy it. That's what I've been told. But no, you can, and for everyone who's asked, no, you cannot get a license to bring in a drone. It's not just that you have to get a license to bring one in, you can't bring one in. Technically, there's a license that you can get, but you have to be resident first. Generally, you have to have a business here, and we only know of one really large Korean international firm that was able to get it approved. This is not something that anyone watching this channel is ever going to approach the capability of getting. That doesn't mean that people don't sneak them in. It doesn't mean that people don't manage to get footage off of them, but they are not legal. And if you try to bring one in, you risk getting caught. It is probably not the worst penalty in the world. We lost our beautiful son and we've moved indoors. Okay, our next question. How is the internet in Nicaragua? Actually, the internet is one of the reasons that you would consider Nicaragua over a lot of other options. Nicaragua has extensively really good internet infrastructure throughout the country, even in pretty rural areas, but especially in the cities you have access to. First of all, multiple ISPs like Claro, uh, Tigo, and Teco, uh, and including cable, uh, fixed Wi-Fi, and fiber, and the fiber is very, very fast and reliable. So that's actually a driving reason for Nicaragua uh, compared to a lot of countries because the internet is reasonably affordable and quite stable and fast. So if you're looking for digital nomadry or you're looking for an expat experience where you wanna be able to work from home and you need to have that reliable internet, Nicaragua can offer that. Of course, like anywhere, you can get cheap internet that is less reliable and not very fast. But if you're out there seeking really good internet, it is an option. I personally use Teco in every location that I am. I have really good symmetrical speeds on fiber absolutely everywhere. I have four different locations of my own that all use it, and they've been amazing, not just when things work, but also when we need service. They're amazing how fast they come out uh, and make sure that things get fixed. So we've been very happy with them. We're also able to buy things like high-end uh, ubiqu Ubiquity Unify uh, Wi-Fi gear and stuff like that here in country. We can't get the biggest selection. We can't always get the latest model, but we can get high-quality good stuff without too much of a problem. And that allows us to have, and you can see it behind me, this just happens to be the one that I work from most of the time, uh, but we were able to get good gear here. Um, you know, certainly, it's a smaller selection. Certainly, you have to drive farther to get to a store, but really, even going into Managua is not that far from most of the country to shop at the big stores. How is the power in Nicaragua? Does the electric go off regularly? So this is a tough one, and people like to argue about it a lot. So first of all, just like anything, the power is different in different parts of the country. So if you live in one place, your experience could be very different. And a lot of expats live in and around San Juan del Sur. This is an extremely remote and disconnected from much of the country region. Often they live by the beach, out on the coast, sometimes in, in pretty remote areas. So of course, internet out there is going to be far inferior to in the big cities. In the main cities, the power is pretty reliable. Nicaragua is not just its own power generator, but it provides inner, uh, power to much of the region, all the way up to Mexico, so many countries in between. Everyone depends on it, so power generation here is very important. Nicaragua has quite a bit of wind, water, hydroelectric, geothermal with the volcanoes, solar, and other uh, green sources. So it's generating a lot of green power. We don't see power plants around the country, but we see windmills and, and uh, dams and solar farms quite often. So it's a, it, it's a power positive country, plus a lot of people put solar on their own buildings or even small wind generators. Solar is very affordable here because uh, we have direct access to the Chinese market. So we're often able to get more advanced and lower cost solar than you're able to get in the United States. And because it ships directly from China, uh, it doesn't pass through other places. So we actually have a pretty good supply chain for certain types of things, and that is one of them. So power is specifically pretty good here because we're generating it and we have to keep it on or we wouldn't keep making money when we sell it to other countries. Of course, we do have some power problems. If the power will go out from time to time, just like anywhere, what we've noticed is that the pattern here, especially in the more recent times, is very different than what we experience in the United States. In the United States, we have a tendency to have very long periods of time with very stable power, and then suddenly large outages. A typical outage in the United States is going to be uh, an hour or more, possibly four hours, and certainly on multiple occasions, I've experienced 
weeks. And since we've moved to Nicaragua, we watch the news and are constantly seeing large pieces of the United States where we have hundreds of thousands of people and they're out for days at a time. Those are not things that we have experienced here in Nicaragua, not once in the time that we've been here. Even going back to 2015, we had some pretty big outages localized to just a block or two, uh, but really large outages we never really witnessed. They were more common back then. But since that time, since 2019, the infrastructure investment in the country has been amazing. And uh, we, we saw some outages in 2021 when we were first living here. First of all, we lived out at the beach. So it's a kind of like San Juan del Cirque. It's a lot more remote. And so you're going to get more outages in a, in a beach location than you are in the city. But even being on the beach, we never had an outage of a day or anything like that. But we did have some pretty big outages caused one time. The biggest outage we had was actually caused by a power blowout in Mexico, and they had to shut down the power for us. So it was a, we have to shut down the national grid to, to service Mexico, something that a lot of countries don't have to deal with. Um, the other large outages were almost always planned outages caused by the construction of the major new hospital in the city, and they had to connect it to the grid. Uh, so we had a little bit that we really had to deal with in 2021, but it never hit a day, and it was normally planned. So all the big outages were planned, except for that Mexican one, but they did announce that. Uh, in general, since that time, those have gone away. They, they got the hospital in, Mexico has fixed their grid, and since 2022, 2023, and now 2024, our power has been very, very stable. We do have tiny outages, often under 10 seconds. And those happen maybe once or twice a week. So we protect against those with just simple batteries or using laptops instead of desktops. And we essentially don't even notice them. We'll hear beeps, uh, see a light go out because it's not on a battery. And that's about it. Uh, the other day we had a big outage, went about three to five minutes. That was really noticeable. Having an outage that goes for more than a few minutes is kind of a big deal. We've been sitting outside and heard transformers blow in the local neighborhood, see sparks go up, just huge explosions and have the power either stay on or be back within under 10 seconds. The ability to deal with the number of problems that occur is really amazing. And considering there's constant car accidents, it's very, very hot, so transformers blow all the time. Uh, it's a very poor country, so you don't expect there to be the high quality of equipment used and, and uh, devices installed as you would get in like the United States or whatever. And yet we find that the power seems to be more stable. Everyone we know in the United States is experiencing at least a little bit more power outage than we get. So it's hard to compare because if you just count the number of outages, yeah, we have more outages here. If you count up the time that you have an outage, I know of nowhere in the U.S. that doesn't have dramatically more time without power than here in Nicaragua. So it all depends what you're looking at and how you're prepared to deal with it. If you have a life support system and no ability to have a battery, then systems like Nicaragua could be really problematic. You'd have a blip now and then. It would cause your devices to fail. But if you have batteries and basic protection, you have no problem at all. But of course, if you're in the United States and you have a generator, you have no problem too. You can go for days without power, just throw fuel in your generator. Here, it is common for people to have lots of batteries and it's even common to have generators, although we have had a generator since 2021. In 2021, we certainly were like, oh, we can't go half a day. We're gonna miss meetings, all kinds of things. Gotta have a generator. Since 2021, we have not fired up our generator. We don't even bring it to our house. We keep it somewhere in storage because we just don't need it. It's a completely different experience now. So we're prepared for really long outages just in case, partially because things are very affordable here. So it's easy to be ready for that stuff, but we don't actually need to use it and don't find that if, if a major outage happens, we probably wouldn't bother hooking it up in most cases. We now have batteries that go much longer and we've done things like purchase computers that use less power and made some adjustments to how we have things plugged in. But what's nice is with the batteries we have, we're able to keep our internet running, our Wi-Fi running. Uh, I even did live streams. We had the power go out for about 10 to 15 seconds on a live stream just a couple weeks ago and it just kept right on working. We actually were able to do the live stream and it never dropped at all. The internet didn't drop, the cameras didn't drop, the audio didn't drop, the streaming didn't, nothing. Everything kept working except the lights. The lights went out and we we're like, what, what happened? Uh, and so very impressed with the way the power can be handled here. So however you measure it, the way that I would measure it is how much is power outages potentially a life impacting thing. And here in Nicaragua, my experience over the last few years is that power here is immensely non-impactful. But when I lived in the United States, it was extremely impactful. Both when I was young, we would lose power in New York and we would be in houses that were below freezing degrees, freezing degrees, below freezing. Uh, and that made it very hard to, to, we couldn't cook food. We couldn't do things. Everything depended on electricity. Here, we don't even depend on electricity for cooking and things like that. We, we use fuel, uh, uh, natural gas. And so 
that changes things a lot. Um, but when I lived in Texas, and just in the weeks, literally weeks before we moved to Nicaragua permanently, we had to go a number of weeks without power in Nicaragua, and it was a an event so dramatic that everywhere we went, people's pipes were bursting, and the houses were freezing. Every time we got a blip of power, we had to open ovens and crank them all the way up. It was crazy how how much we were using and uh, trying to f trying to find ways to keep the house from completely freezing. We had to, to pack heat everywhere, burn anything we could. Absolutely crazy. And for a place like Texas that you imagine being so warm that it could lose power for so long that people freezing to death was a real concern uh, is amazing. Here, if the power is out for a long time, you're not going to freeze. You can still cook. Like life can go on. Sure, if you need to work and attend a meeting remotely, it's going to be a problem. But for normal everyday life, you can still go to restaurants, even if they're completely in the dark. They're going to keep making your food, taking orders, and life goes on. So it's both that the electricity is on more here. And the way that we lose electricity here is better, for most people at least. And even if you were to lose electricity, the impact to you is far less just because of the lifestyles. And so you put it all together. Uh, plus, it's warm here, right? We never need heat. And you can you never actually need air conditioning, right? It, it just doesn't get that hot. We don't have 110 degree days like Dallas does. We only ever hit 99, which is unpleasant. But it isn't to the point where you have to have air conditioning. It's just to the point where you want it. How expensive is your electricity in Nicaragua? This is a tough one because it varies by the way that you use it and it varies by where you live. So the answer is not easy to give. It's different for just about everyone. For us, what we found, so when we lived in the United States, so this is the best thing we can do, right, is compare our lives in the United States to our lives in Nicaragua. And of course, as people have pointed out before, well, if you want to talk about how expensive it is to have electricity uh, versus life expenses, it's two different ways to measure it. On a, let's start with on a per kilowatt basis. If you're purely measuring kilowatts, typically Nicaragua is going to cost more than almost anywhere in North America. Not dramatically more, but it's going to be on the high side for sure. Most of the places we've viewed in the United States are noticeably cheaper per kilowatt. However, in the United States, you expect that everyone is billed kilowatts on a very even basis. You use 10, you're billed for 10. It's very straightforward. Almost no one that we know in Nicaragua is billed for exactly the number of kilowatts that they use. This is confusing. So for us, for example, we are billed for only a fraction of the kilowatts that are measured on our meter. I know other people who are given flat rates, like it's all over the place. And some people pay for every kilowatt. And so the prices are quite wild. What I can do is tell you what we've actually paid. When I lived in the United States, most of the time that we lived in our house in Texas. Now, this is Texas, and so for a lot of the year, it's very cheap for electricity because their electricity is cheap, the taxes are low, and the houses don't need a whole lot, uh, except for in a small piece of the summer, then you need a lot of air conditioning. And they use central air, not the super efficient split units like we use here in Central America. So when we lived in Texas, about the lowest we ever saw our power bill get, and this is quite a while ago, so this is before inflation, was about $250, and the highest that I ever got was $800. $150. That is for a three bedroom, two bath ranch in North Dallas. So that's a pretty big range, but it's a pretty big range of power being used as well. It's also worth noting that at no point during the hottest months of the year were we able to keep the house cool enough to be truly comfortable. The lowest we could get the house during the hot months was about 84 degrees, and we would have all kinds of, of problems with our cooling units at that temperature. If we tried to go to 83, it wouldn't even be possible in many cases. So that was, we were keeping the place at 84, it was uncomfortable, and we were paying hundreds. Very rarely did we hit 800. We were normally on our high months between four and 600. When we moved to Nicaragua, obviously it is warmer here. We need air conditioning year round. We're not from here, so air conditioning is important. I'm sitting in an office with bright lights on me, running air conditioning on my cameras and computers and all these things that are using power. We use a lot of power here. So we moved the same people from Texas to here. This is as best a comparison as we can make. When we first did this, now when I lived in Texas and when I live here now, we have five people that officially live in the house. We're gonna get to that. When I first moved to Nicaragua, long ago, 2015, we were living in Granada with four people. At that time, in downtown Granada, paying someone who was paying the bill, so we don't know if we were paying the actual bill or not, I suspect not. In fact, I'm completely confident we were not. We were getting gringo priced by someone who was ripping us off in between paying the bill and the, and the actual bill being paid. We were paying about $400, maybe $450 per month. That was ridiculous and our largest expense. 
But at the same time, our home, when we were, had just come from Texas, we moved basically from Texas to there, not exactly, but several months before. And uh, we had been paying above 400 there. So we weren't shocked by the bill, but we were kind of shocked that the bill was that high in Nicaragua, but we weren't shocked with it compared to where we had lived. We were shocked because we had lived in Panama and Spain in between, and those places were not so expensive. So that was kind of our impression there. Wow, the electricity is expensive here, and we were using split units. We thought we were being really conservative with them, and they were saying that we use that much. But now a lot of people told us, no, they were faking the prices to you and uh, gouging you on it. So we don't know if that was a real number, but that's a real thing you have to watch out for. If you're not paying the power company directly, you easily are getting ripped off. Now, since that time, so those numbers, when we hit the 850, when we were doing four to 600 a month, when we paid the 450 in Granada, all that was before the COVID inflation. So all numbers today are bigger than what we're comparing them to. If I lived in Texas now, I'd expect the peak of my power bill to be well above a thousand a month and my monthly normal to be between three and 400. I have family members who are paying five to 600 for larger houses, but in Houston. So here in Nicaragua, we first had a house. Uh, now, we did live on the beach for a while, but we have no way to compare that power. It's a completely bizarre scenario. But living in La Borrio in downtown uh, Leon, Nicaragua, we were paying about $120 uh, per month. I think the peak we ever hit, about $150. And I think at one point, we actually dropped to $90. Uh, but typically, we were about $120. We had air conditioning in a number of rooms. I believe it was in seven rooms. It was at least six. Um, and so a lot of those rooms were very small, but two of those air conditioners were not split units. So they used a lot more electricity, uh, but didn't run very often. The split units ran a lot more often, uh, but they use a lot less electricity and they're better vented. Um, so these kinds of units, highly recommended. So when we did that, the cost of electricity there, about $150, and that's for five people officially living there full time. But there's almost always other people there because we just always had visitors or staff that were staying at the house. So even though it's five people, assume it's more like six. And sometimes we would have guests when we lived in Texas too, but we didn't really have space for them. So it was relatively rare. So it was really five people there. When we moved here to Sutiava, a couple things happened. One is we move out of the city center. So in theory, that lowers the per kilowatt price or they reduce the number of kilowatts that they bill you for, however they want to handle that. And we live in a place that has a lot more open air so that it stays cooler. It doesn't hold the heat like the middle of the city. So even though we're in a hot zone, we're not in an area of that zone that holds the heat as much. Hopefully that makes sense. So in theory, we don't need as much heat here. However, we have a nine bedroom instead of a seven bedroom. We have many more rooms with air conditioning like this one. Not only does my office and our game room have air conditioning, but every bedroom has it. Plus we have staff who have lived here full time the entire time we've been here. And plus we often have guests staying here as well, often in rooms that are air conditioned. So the amount of air conditioning that we're using here is really high compared to what we used in Labo Rio, even though we're in an area that's cooler. So the air conditioning doesn't have to work as hard, but we use more of it and we air condition more rooms and the rooms are quite a bit larger. My office here is easily three times the size. Actually, once you consider the airspace, it's probably four to five times the airspace of the uh, office I had in Lava Rio. It's larger in every dimension and almost twice the height. The other one was right here. So with all of this, we are paying between 40 and $80 per month for our power for all of this. And as you know, I have studio lights and cameras and computers running around the clock. We do so much technology here. We have so many, we have four Wi-Fi units around the house, not that they use that much power, but with all these people charging so many devices, more TVs than we had before, we keep adding things as we live here and purchase things in country. We are using so much more from a what we get out of our life for it. And we're only paying 40 to $80 a month for our electricity. That's pretty amazing, um, and especially when you consider that this, if we were doing the same thing in Texas, we would be paying one to $2,000 per month. Keep in mind, I'm able to turn all of these rooms down to 68 degrees if I want, and the air conditioners will be able to handle it. I don't recommend doing that. Uh, we actually keep them much closer to the high 70, like 77, 78. But remember in Texas, we couldn't get below 84, even when we were paying hundreds or close to $1,000 a month in current money. So to be able to do the same thing and somehow put in a unit big enough to be able to get it down to 78, it would easily be getting close to $2,000 a month up in Texas. So that's a pretty big, even if you went with a small number with $1,000, $40 here to $1,000, that's something like 25 times. Um, 
that's that's just amazing, right? So uh, electricity here tends to be less expensive in my experience, but I've had viewers who hop on and are like, I pay this huge amount. I don't know why they pay that huge amount. I don't know if they've got very inefficient things. I don't know if they live in a spot that charges more. I don't know if they're getting ripped off by someone. I don't know. Um, I don't know if we're the opposite. Are we somehow magically in a spot, multiple spots that pay really little? We're totally getting supplemented somehow. We don't know. But that's that's the complication. We know what we've observed, and we know other people are paying even less than us, and we know other people are paying more. So it's all over the place. But we don't know how they're using their, their air conditioning. We don't know how they're using their computers. And we don't know if they're running other things that we don't know about. But uh, worth noting other things is that the way that power is built is also a sliding scale. Even if you live in a place that's relatively expensive, if you use extremely little power, the idea is that your power is basically going to be free. And then you pay more per kilowatt as you use more power. This is designed to make it that people who are able to spend more can use more power, but they're going to pay to supplement the people who can't afford it. And this is important because people who are quite poor need to have lights, they need to have the ability to you know, send messages and charge their phones. That's really important. And for those of us who can afford to have computers and cameras and air conditioning, well, yeah, we should probably be supplementing the people who are not able to have those things, and I think that's a great plan. So it's a really good system in my mind uh, as to how they do that. But be aware that it can make a system where some people may only pay $2 and other people may pay $1,000, right? Now, we also have uh, an apartment very nearby, but it's not in the open area like this, and it's not in the same barrio we were in originally. It's in another barrio. So we have another place that we test month to month, and we know what it costs. And in that location, now that's a two-bedroom, relatively small apartment, but it's, I mean, it's pretty good size. It's probably in the um, 800 square feet kind of range. It's, uh, that's probably too big. 600 square feet. It has a pretty good living room. It is larger than the average uh, Nicaraguan modern two bedroom house. Like it's actually larger than that. For an apartment, it's quite big. Um, it has a one really large bedroom, one normal size bedroom, a decent sized living room. And the way that they do it here is typically uh, just a long living room, dining room, kitchen space. And you just kind of partition however you want to use it, just big open space. And then two bedrooms and a bathroom in the middle. Super standard, you find it all over. In that space, we put in two air conditioning units uh, and it has all the regular appliances, has a big fridge, bigger than most Nicaraguans would put in. Uh, it has a washing machine, not that that uses a ton of power, but it, it could use some. Um, it has the two air conditionings. When it's there, it tends to get run pretty heavily. Uh, and it doesn't have ceiling windows. It has slats like this, so it's not super efficient. You could do a lot to make it more efficient. And I know their power bill uh, for one month there, and it's not, you know, it's only a maximum of three people that are ever there. They're not there every single moment of the day, unlike here where we really are, because this is our home offices as well. So we're really using power here. There, it's much more like a normal apartment. People go to school, they're gone during the day, but their total power bill was between $10 and $11. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of a completely separate, anything that we're getting here that might be a discount, be unrelated down there. So we're seeing numbers that actually seem to add up a little bit. If you were to extrapolate two air conditioners down there to all the ones we have down here, three people there to say nine people here, depending on who's here, how much, uh, maybe we got more efficient walls here that we're paying maybe 80 and that is 10, totally makes sense. If anything, we're probably less efficient here, which totally makes sense. Um, so easy to see that those numbers seem to be consistent in this region. But again, we, it's still anecdotal. You would have to go all over the country and you'd have to monitor every different scenario to figure out how they're actually using power. How, is it the time of day that they're using it? Who knows all the different ways that they may use to discount or punish power in different ways. But what we've seen from our own experience in recent times is that the power is very, very affordable here in Nicaragua. Can I flush toilet paper in Nicaragua? So the quick answer is no. Basically, none of the cities and none of the beach areas, none of the places you're likely to go anywhere in Nicaragua have septic systems that are built to take toilet paper. Now, as people will say, but I flush it and it works. Well, clearly they don't understand the concept of flushing toilet paper. Yes, the toilet will push the paper down. That is not what anyone is saying when they say you can't flush toilet paper. What they mean when they say they can't touch flush toilet paper is that the infrastructure is not built for it and you're not supposed to do it because you're going to cause problems. Maybe not today, but for someone down the line. And that's not pleasant and you're not supposed to do it. But mostly it's a cultural thing. It's not like there's a law or there's not like, you know, someone's going to actually check. But in Nicaragua, there is 
essentially no place where it is designed for you to flush toilet paper except for very high-end hotels. If you go stay in the Hilton Princess downtown, of course, you can flush toilet paper there. But in normal places, uh, they don't have grinders. They don't have their own private septic systems. It's got to go into the public system, and they're not prepared for it. For people who are putting in their own septic fields, they're not planning on it either because it's not a cultural thing. No one's used to it, so no one's preparing for that. Um, and as people point out, well, if I build it, I'll build it so it can do that. Yes, of course, if you are building your own house and putting in your own septic system, you can build it to do anything you want. That's not what anyone's talking about. When we say, hey, can you flush toilet paper? It means if you're just in the country, you're in an apartment, you're in someone else's house, you're renting, you're in a normal hotel, you're visiting someone, you're in a business, can you flush toilet paper? No. There's going to be a trash can next to the, the toilet. That's what you need to use. Do people flush a tiny bit of toilet paper? I'm sure they do, but that the idea is minimize it as much as possible. Yes, people really do put lots and lots of toilet paper into the trash cans. Yes, it's gross, but lots of the world does it, and you just have to get used to it if you want to live outside of very few limited places. And going to Europe is not one of those places where you can get away from it. I got used to not being able to flush toilet paper in Europe, not in Latin America. Uh, I lived in Spain, couldn't flush. Italy, couldn't flush. Greece, couldn't flush. Romania, I think we could, but I'm not actually sure. Pretty sure we could. But basically, if you're on the Mediterranean, you're not going to be able to flush. Places that are on sandy beach terrain often struggle with that. They have to put in massive infrastructure to, to suck that stuff away and, and take it somewhere else to be able to have it be flushable. And so places like Miami do that, but very few Mediterranean locations are, are new enough and rich enough and big enough to be able to do that. So same thing in Latin America. A lot of the cities are really old, so upgrading infrastructures to handle that is not realistic in the majority of cases. Can I get Amazon and other shipments from the United States? <laughs> yes, of course you can. You can get all kinds of things. However, we have to preface this. None of those things can come direct. No company is going to ship directly from the United States to you here. What actually happens is they need to ship and you need to have a shipping service ready somewhere in the United States so that they are able to ship to your shipping service and then that shipping service will send it to you here. So it's a completely different experience and it's you have to adjust to it and it makes things more expensive and take longer. You're not going to get three-hour shipping from Amazon. That's just ridiculous. Everything's going to happen in the United States or wherever you're ordering from, but if you're living in Nicaragua, chance are United States is where you want to order from because once you're bothering to order from here, you want it to be affordable, you want it to be close, and that's going to be the best option until you start ordering direct from China. That will definitely lower your cost if you can get used to doing that. But you order in uh, uh, Amazon, for example, you send it to a shipper in Miami, typically. They put it on a plane pretty quickly, and it's not really that long. But here, not that long is very different. In the U.S., you're expecting next day for basically everything. Here, we really talk about like, hey, I'm getting it in two weeks. That's amazing. That's so fast. So you have to get used to that. But they will deliver it around the country. You can have it delivered right to your door, and it is within reason. It is certainly more expensive than doing things in the United States. You can't just get free shipping. You're definitely going to pay a bunch of fees, you may end up paying a bit of customs, so you could pay quite a bit more. It's going to encourage you to only do it for things you really need, but when there's something you really need, no problem, you'll be able to get it. Uh, so it's, it's you know, it is available, but you're not going to want to use it a lot of the time. What about TV and internet streaming services? Am I going to be able to use any of those? So absolutely. Here in Nicaragua, we have, first of all, we have cable television. So we have hundreds of channels and you can use that. Claro and Tigo and some others provide big cable packages and they're very affordable. Uh, they actually make it basically free with your internet in many cases. So feel free to get those packages, hook them up to a TV. We've had them and we've never bothered to plug them in because who cares? It's not something we're interested in. But uh, if you do want to have regular television, you can certainly watch it to your heart's content. There are so many channels here. Um, I don't know how good they are because I've never hooked it up. Not I never used cable when I lived in the United States either, so uh, I can't compare it, but uh, that does exist. As far as streaming services, we have basically everything that you do other places. We have Netflix and uh, Amazon Prime and Disney Plus and many other things. So for those, you're generally going to look at more or less the same services as you have anywhere else. In some cases, they're going to be restricted to Nicaragua, and in all cases, they give different content in different countries. So just like anywhere else, it is common for people to use a VPN, pretend they're somewhere that they're not, and tell the service that's where they are and get a different selection of things. And in that case, you can get anything that's available in the United States if you're doing that. You can even get Hulu, which isn't available in the region. Of course, you have to have a credit card in a region where it'll let you sign up for whatever service. You're still limited by that. So if you move everything to Nicaragua and have no credit cards from somewhere else, 
that may limit you a little bit for some of those services, but Netflix and those work just fine. So in general, all those streaming services are available. Plus, you can always bring your DVDs with you. You can rip your DVDs, and I'm using DVDs like anyone knows that word anymore. Your Blu-rays, rip them onto a hard drive, connect them to a computer, and uh, use them with, with Cody or Jellyfin uh, or other services like that. There's lots of, lots of ways to have media here, and uh, things like Steam and GOG and Epic, all the video game services, they work just the same here as well. So actually, digital, de digital delivery is a really big thing here uh, because it's so hard to get things in physically, and physically th physical things are subject to high taxation, whereas uh, digital things are tax-free. And so uh, it's, it's normal to order things online. You can use the Nintendo a switch store online buy all that stuff um, and so you can you can easily get digital games and movies and, and TV shows and whatever and, uh, and and in many ways it's just as good or, or better maybe here because uh, in some cases the, the cost is lower uh, and you're a lot more flexible with the things you're allowed to do can I invest or start a business there in Nicaragua and and use that as my income can I pay my bills using a business so the quick answer, the easy answer is no. No, you cannot. Like, just don't think about this. Is it physically possible? Are you allowed to start a business in Nicaragua? Absolutely. Is it allowed to make money? Sure, they would love if you could. Are you realistically going to be able to do so and make enough money from it that you're going to want to live off of it? No, that is not realistic. Not at all. Very few people who have come to Nicaragua to have a business have been able to make that kind of money. When they do so, almost always, it took them many, many years and they were here before times got tough, before the tourists went away, before there were all these problems with the economy. And so they, they've made their investment and they paid off a lot of their investment uh, dollars and time early on and now are able to reap some of those rewards. But even people who've been here for 20 years and had very successful businesses in the past are often losing now. That doesn't mean that you'll never be able to invest, you'll never be able to make money, that it's always going to be a tough thing. But for the long past and the foreseeable future, it is not a place where you can start a business with the goal of making money. If you want to start a business because you like having a business, because you want to have a business that does a thing, like you just want certain things that you can't get here currently, or you don't think you can get here and you want to start your own business to do it, great, that's fine. Just don't think of it in terms of, and it's going to pay your bills. That is so unrealistic. It's hard to get people to understand how dramatically unrealistic that is. Because it means not only do you need to get a business that is able to not lose money, but you then have to make it make so much money that it's able to actually give you profits and not just profits, but profits large enough for you to live off of. That's actually pretty large. And if you are considering um, profits large enough that someone from North America or Europe is going to be happy with the amount that they make, that's even larger. And when you're competing against businesses here, basically, so two things. One, everybody coming in, every extranjero, every expat coming into the country thinks they have a unique business idea that no one else has thought of that is brilliant and, and Nicaraguans are just going to be so glad that they came up with this thing. And they universally are coming up with ideas that everyone has talked about, everybody suggests, and everyone shoots down because once you come here, you realize there's no way that that would make money. The second part is, even if you had a decent idea, because it's a foreign market, it doesn't matter that it's Nicaragua, just it's a foreign market, you are always at a disadvantage. The people in the local market have more know-how, they have more experience, they have more access to resources, they have more government protection, they just have more, and they're able to work in their own businesses freely. That means they have this huge advantage over you. Even if all other things are equal, they are almost certainly able to crush you because they have so many advantages. They're just going to be able to run their company for less money and more easily and faster. They're also, in most cases, willing to work for less money. You may be only happy if you're able to bring in an income uh, in excess of $12,000 a year, but a Nicaraguan may be happy running the same business and only making $6,000 a year. That is not fair that you should get more money, but you won't actually get more money. It's just that you'll be unhappy unless you get to that point. They may be perfectly happy running a business that wouldn't pay your bills, but it's doing just fine for them and they get to have their own business and so they're happy to do so. So your expectations can be quite a bit different as well. So there's just a lot of things that uh, make it very, very, very difficult for someone who's foreign to come into any market and compete against the local market. Unless you have something really unique, you're bringing in a massive amount of investment, you have some really significant know-how, 
uh, assume you're going to lose against the locals and the locals are not really making money in business most of the time um, and, and in some cases they're allowed to do businesses that you're not allowed to do either their government doesn't allow you to do things or your government doesn't allow you to do things it's just a lot of limitations so the expectation that you're going to be able to make money is just very very difficult um, you're welcome to try and it can be very beneficial to the economy come and make jobs but just be realistic that you generally as someone coming in from the outside have the ability to work remotely to somewhere else and bring in foreign money that is better for the country it is probably vastly larger sums of money for you it is more reliable because you'll just get a paycheck rather than hoping your business is successful long term there's just many many reasons why that works out better nine out of ten 99 out of 100 times so yes legally you can start a business will you be able to start a business and support yourself i truly know no people who have been able to do that. None. Uh, they exist. I know that they're out there, but they are few and far between. Um, and in the rare cases where people are, you know, saying they make money quite often when you look, it's, well, they're supplementing from abroad. They're supplementing through tax evasion. There's just all kinds of things. Like they're, they're not actually doing the business in Nicaragua. It's just some of it's like, there's a lot of different things. And you're like, okay, that's not what people mean when they say, are you living off of it? Um, or maybe they're living partially off of savings, all kinds of things. Could it offset stuff? If you're really lucky, it may help offset your savings, but most people will lose month to month. And if you're not not in business, if you're not already experienced in business, if the idea of losing month to month doesn't just terrify you, then you should really step back and say, wait, I'm not an experienced business person in a market that's much easier. Nicaragua is a very hard market in general, let alone being the fact that it's a foreign market for you. It's just a hard market. And so it's important to step back and go, whoa, this is not the place to be figuring out if I know how to do this or not. How is the healthcare in Nicaragua? This is a great question because you think we're gonna say it's okay, it's good enough, but the reality is it's excellent. Every single time that we have to engage or anyone we know has to engage with the medical system, the response is consistently that it's amazing. It is very low cost. In many cases, it is free if you need it. There's public health care available to everyone, including expats. There is many health care options. We have regional health care options as well. Just in case Nicaragua doesn't have what you need, you can easily go to our nearby partners as close as El Salvador or Costa Rica or farther afield like Colombia or Mexico. It's very common to use these regions for extended health care because it's it's a small country. So the same as you would use just going to another state in the United States, for example, for your healthcare, you could do that here. And it's very close and easy and very, very affordable. But what we've also found is that the patient care, the focus on taking care of the patient without a focus on the business aspects, without a focus on the doctor always being right and telling you what to do, they really want to know what's wrong. They really want to fix what's wrong. They put in the effort. So the, the quality of care, the, the success rate seems completely different. And it's, of course, a small subset that we see. But for all of us who have experienced healthcare of any type, from dental to major surgery to emergencies to just checkups, every single aspect of the healthcare here in Nicaragua has been superior. It's not like we, we, we expect that we're going to keep saying, well, there's trade-offs. We haven't found those trade-offs. I'm sure they exist somewhere, right? There's certainly some medicines that are a struggle for us to get here. But overall, the healthcare is so vastly superior, just so far ahead of the United States. And, and part of it, and I've been explaining this by doctors, in the United States, there's a very high reliance on uh, diagnostic equipment. They wait for the computers and the machines to tell them what is going on and then they use humans to supplement that, to verify that. And that gives a very different approach, partially because those things all, they charge for them. So you spend all this money, they go, oh, let's make some more money to do some more tests and they keep doing tests and they wait till the tests tell them what's going on. And here they do doctor first and the, the doctor sits down with the patient, does as much diagnostics as they can, says, okay, we think we know what this is. Let's go get the minimum number of tests to verify that we're right. And so they lead with all this getting to know what's going on. And then they do a lot fewer tests at very low cost, very quickly. And that is how they end up with a different type of healthcare. It really is completely different. And once you experience it a bit outside of the United States in general, now, when we say outside the United States, we always mean outside the US, Canada, and UK. You cannot, if anyone ever says, oh, but Canada doesn't, they are 
cherry picking a known terrible non-American health system to try to come up with an example. And that's how hard they have to work. They will always pick Canada and the UK because they stand out as the worst developed world healthcare ever. Come to Latin America, every single Latin American country has better healthcare than those three. Every single one of them. Nicaragua is not the best in Latin America. Wouldn't pretend it is, but it's quite good. It's good to a level that if you're coming from North America, you will spend most likely the rest of your life never stopping being amazed by just how good the healthcare is. People have asked, well, what if there's a major emergency? Would you fly back to the United States? Absolutely not. If I'm in the United States and I have a major, major emergency, I wouldn't be flown to Nicaragua. That's probably not true. I probably would get flown to Mexico or Colombia because if it's a major emergency and what if I fly to Nicaragua and it is something that they can't handle and they would need to send me on to a larger one, I would just start by going to a larger one. That's, that's honest, right? But if I was in Nicaragua, I would not leave until my local hospital told me, whoop, this is beyond us. We're going to stabilize you, do everything we can, and then get you there. But if I was already traveling, I would go on most likely to Colombia because Medellin is just the, the heartland of healthcare, right? But absolutely no, I would not go to the U.S. for healthcare. I would do anything I can to get out of the U.S. for healthcare. Every time we set foot into the United States, we're worried about what if something happens while in the United States. We're, we don't have access to good quality Nicaraguan healthcare. And everyone I know that has been here any amount of time and dealt with healthcare ends up with the same story. And we have multiple people that we've done in the past. We've done interviews with like Paul and Kat about their healthcare experiences over the years. I actually have up on my screen as I'm saying this, the, the Nicaragua emergency hospital trip in an ambulance from over a year ago, interview with Paul in Lava Rio, it was probably almost two years ago at this point. Um, and, and Kat did in-home health care. And my kids, uh, I need to at some point do dental. I need, I've got a couple people I need to interview about dental. Because dental has been just fantastic here. Some people complain about, oh, they didn't find good dental. They're not looking very hard because really good dental is out there. And everyone I know knows how to find really good dental here. And, and dental that is solving problems that American dentists were unable to fix for long periods of time. Suddenly, they're able to come here and, and get great dental care and get things fixed just like that for cheap that the US wasn't able to fix. Like that, it's not expensive. It's not, you know, takes a while. They weren't able to do it. And here they just casually went, oh, you want us to fix this? It's a completely different experience. But we also have a couple people who have done uh, some stuff recently. Um, one has already made a video and I'm gonna be uh, doing that at some point soon. And one is lined up to do an interview. We're actually gonna do an in-person interview about uh, some recent healthcare that he just did. Uh, so we have multiple, remember, but the, the stories we get consistently from, from people we know, from people we meet is always, I can't believe how good the healthcare is in Nicaragua. So of all things, healthcare is a reason to look at Nicaragua compared to places that you often look at because of healthcare. Right. If, now, if you're looking at like a Colombia, yeah, you're not going to pick Nicaragua over Colombia because of healthcare. But there's basically no situation that we've discovered where Nicaragua wouldn't be. Well, what about the healthcare? Ah, oh, yeah, Nicaragua. It checks the box. You can definitely use the healthcare there, whether it's public or private, or whether you're paying for it, whether you decide to get insurance or not. That's not a lot of people don't get that. You can get healthcare plans. So many options, and using like pharmacies and, and that kind of stuff here has been great as well. The just the entire healthcare experience here so excellent. We can't rave about it enough. Do I need to have a car in Nicaragua? So this mostly depends up to you. So one thing let's start with, all the cars here are manual. I'm sure that somewhere an automatic exists, but I've never seen one and assume you're not going to find one. For most people, no, you do not need a car. You may want one, it may be practical or useful, but you absolutely don't need one in almost all situations. Now, if you're going to be living on a farm, you're going to be very rural, you're going to be doing a lot of farm or business tasks where you need to drive things around, yes, having a truck may be incredibly practical. So assume that that could be the case. But in most cases, most people, especially if you're retired, but even if you're not, even if you're a digital nomad or whatever, it is really easy to live in Nicaragua without a car for a couple of reasons. One, the country's not that big. It's 
pretty easy to get around. Two, everything's centralized in Managua. So in most cases, public transportation only has to get you to Managua and then back out to wherever you need to go. And you don't do a ton of going from point to point. Of course, if you're a tourist or something, you may do quite a bit, but there isn't a lot of that in general. So the, the public infrastructure for transportation works really well for getting people around the country. Most people don't have cars here. So everything is designed around a populace that already doesn't have cars. So that you would need one stands out like, well, why doesn't everyone else need one? Well, they probably don't either. So that's something you also need to consider, right? Just lots of people don't have it. So the, the streets aren't as full of cars as you would often expect. And people from here, when they see like the United States or even Mexico, or something, they're amazed by how many cars are on the road because Nicaragua has so few, but it's one of the things that makes Nicaragua so nice. It keeps the roads safe. It is easy to get around in most cases. It means that there isn't cars parked and blocking things everywhere. The cities are not full of parking lots. It's amazing. We truly hope that fewer and fewer cars get brought into the country because it is one of the things making Nicaragua so great. If it had way more cars, it would certainly deteriorate the country significantly. But as someone who lives here, being able to take public transportation for super cheap all over the place is incredibly nice. It does take a little bit of learning. It takes a little bit of getting used to. And depending on who you talk to, you get different stories about how to do it. But there is quite a lot. There's the chicken buses, there's the UCA buses, there's private shuttles, there's the taxis everywhere. And it's generally quite safe. And it's a little bit confusing to use. That I'll give you. Yeah. Is 2024 a good year to be buying property or a house in Nicaragua? Yes, if you're looking as a place that you want to own and you already know that it's a, a place that you want to buy, the current real estate market in Nicaragua is excellent. There are extremely few buyers and an awful lot of sellers. It is a difficult market to find what you may be looking for, but your prices are near the best that they're ever going to be. We've been on a historic low, and so it is the absolute best time to be actually making a purchase here. Now, of course, that to make a purchase, you need to put in enough time to have made a good decision about where you want to be and which house makes sense for you, what kind of living you want. You don't want to be making snap decisions just because the prices are good right now, but they've been good for the last five years. So you're not looking at a really rapid recovery that's going to suddenly turn things around overnight. So you're probably going to be able to maintain good prices for quite some time. But if it's something that you may be interested in, whether for the really long term or just something you're suddenly looking at, whatever, whether it's retirement or a place you want to actually move to uh, while you're still working, it is a really good time to start doing your investigation right away because if you discover that Nicaragua is the right place for you, you probably want to buy pretty soon, not rushing, but not stalling either. There's a happy medium where you're moving forward with a with a real good pace. The birds are very happy right now, but not making reckless decisions. Should I consider building rather than buying an, exi an existing structure in Nicaragua? <clears throat> This question gets asked a lot. And in general, building is great because you can do custom things and have a type of house that you would not be able to have otherwise. And that may still be true for you here in Nicaragua, but the current market is one that is very much leaning towards pre-built homes because the market has collapsed. Houses that have already been built have an investment that has been lost. If you're going to build, you may get your land at a really good deal, but your construction materials are gonna be roughly normal, maybe just slightly higher than normal, and your labor is gonna be roughly average. So you're not not going to get any discounts. You're going to pay full price for a house, at least at full price Nicaragua market rates on slightly cheaper than normal land. But if you buy a pre-existing, a pre-built house, whether a relatively new one built before the last five years or one that has been around for maybe hundreds of years, you're probably going to get the best deal of its lifetime because the market has never been this good. Of course, you still have to do your diligence and make sure you're not getting priced uh, incorrectly. But if you're getting market price, you're going to get your best value buying something that's pre-existing. If you want to build, then really buying land right now may make sense, but rushing to actually start your construction may not. There's no hurry because the prices on construction material are assumed to probably be coming down in the next few years rather than holding steady or going up. It's not going to be a big savings, but you're not in a rush. I know I'm interested in buying a house in Nicaragua. Should I talk to a real estate agent? I'm glad you asked. No, this requires no more conversation. Everything I say, if I just try to explain it, people just won't listen. The answer is an unequivocal no. 
Do not talk to a real estate agent. Do not look at a real estate agent's website. Do not engage a real estate agency. Do nothing of the sort. That is the absolute worst thing you could do if you're looking for property in Nicaragua, period, end of story. We have so many videos that cover this. Go watch those. I don't wanna go into ad nauseum why it's a bad idea, but just remember, I'm not saying, well, maybe, sometimes. The answer is absolutely no. How do I go about finding a house in Nicaragua? I'm glad you asked. Now, if you're in Nicaragua, you can't use a real estate agent. That will undermine you significantly. You need to go out and look for houses on your own or ask around, look on Facebook Marketplace. This is a tough one. And we do have lots of videos where we dig into this and there's no simple answer. For those of us who are here and actually look at houses, the way it works is we live here and we walk around and drive around and we pay attention all the time. And when something interesting comes up, we asked about it and we ask neighbors about it and we watch it and we pay a lot of attention. And sometimes we see people and sometimes we just know about it or we hear rumors about it or we call around or we get a lawyer and have them check around for us. There's just a lot of processes that we follow and that's how we make it work. There's no central listing service. There's no real estate mechanism that shows all the houses. There's no websites you can go to. None of that stuff exists. There are Some of it exists, but they're not real. There's tons of things that will give you misinformation online, but you don't want to do that. That just makes you less informed. It actually confuses you. You don't want to do that. You want to get real information and you only get that by walking around, talking to real people, trying to make offers, finding out what people paid for houses and make sure your information is current and make sure that they're not gringo pricing you. And that's a difficult one. So generally, if you're actually gonna be honestly inquiring about houses, not just having a beer at the bar with someone and finding out what they paid for theirs, but you actually wanna find out what someone's looking for for theirs, make sure you have Nicaraguans doing that inquiry for you and they never get wind that there's a gringo or anyone foreign somewhere behind the scenes, possibly using foreign money to make the purchase because you will lose any leverage that you had. Originally and you will pay much more than market value most of the time. So it's important to keep at a distance and that makes it very difficult. This is a real challenge. If it was easy, everyone would do it, All right? So there are things, both business and personal, that can be challenges in Nicaragua to get the really good deals, but those deals are out there. You just have to follow the system and not try to act like a North American. Don't bring in a real estate agent, which would instantly flag you as not being Nicaraguan. Nicaraguans wouldn't use a real estate agent. They know better. But foreigners do it all the time and they don't realize that once a real estate agent is engaged, there's no way a good deal can happen because the seller knows that a real estate agent is there, which means they have someone with extra deep pockets who doesn't know what they're doing. You've lost any negotiating advantage and the real estate agent has to make their money on top of it. And all that's if nothing goes wrong. And since there's no official system for real estate agents here, the chances that something will go wrong is extreme. And you aren't protecting yourself by doing that. You're doing anything but. So if you're gonna do a real estate transaction, who do I talk to? The one person you definitely need to engage is a trusted real estate attorney. And you can find these all over the country. There's many people who will help you and that is how Nicaraguans do real estate transactions. It's all through a lawyer. You have to do a lot of due diligence. There's a lot of moving pieces in any market and in Nicaragua, a lot of them are different than almost anywhere that you're probably coming from. US, Canada, Europe, Australia, wherever. Chances are it's a bit different here. You need a lawyer to navigate that and make sure that you're not missing some key part of land registration, mapping, surveys, filing with different departments, taxes that may be missing historically, liens and all kinds of things. It's not a daunting experience. It's not difficult compared to other countries. It's a little bit more time consuming, but you simply turn it over to a lawyer, which a lot of North Americans are hesitant to do because lawyers are so expensive. But when you come to Nicaragua, your lawyers are probably really affordable. And by far, your best value is going to be having a qualified lawyer do your due diligence for you because the thing that's going to be most expensive is anything else. If you don't have a lawyer and you don't do your due diligence, you have a really good chance of paying way too much for a property you may not even end up owning at the end of the day. So make sure you have a lawyer taking care of those things just as you would in any other market. There's no exception to always needing a lawyer when you do these things, but there's an awful lot of time that having a real estate agent doesn't make any sense. I'm a foreigner moving to Nicaragua. Can I open a bank account? So the simple answer is yes, you can. It's probably a pain and not every bank is going to allow you to open one, but there are banking rules that allow you to do so and there are banks that will allow you to do so. Once you become a resident, opening a bank account becomes much easier because you have a national ID card known as a cedula. And if you have a cedula, basically you can open an account at any bank. Although even Nicaraguans with cedulas and jobs in Nicaragua sometimes struggle to open bank accounts themselves. And there may be high minimums and you may only be able to open one type of account, Cordoba or dollars, 
or the other. So there's always some limitations, but that applies to everyone, not just you as a tourist or as a resident or whatever. As an expat that's moving here, yes, you generally can open a bank account, but you may have to hunt around to different banks to find one that is willing to work with you, and everyone's situation will be a little bit unique. In each case, here it's not automatic like it would be in, say, the United States. But we know people in Canada who can't just open one either, so it's not just here that has these complications. Canada, for Canadians, can, under certain circumstances, have some big complexities too. So just be aware that that is potentially a risk um, anywhere. But here, yes, you can probably open a bank account. But it's worth noting that you may not want to open a bank account. It's not necessary for being here. I know that some of you, especially Canadians, want to open bank accounts here for Canadian reasons, not Nicaraguan reasons, and that's perfectly acceptable. If that's why you're doing it, then great, then that may be the thing to do. I would also cons uh, personally recommend maybe considering a Swiss bank account. I say this a lot, Swiss banking makes a lot of sense when you're an expat, but not always, and having a Nicaraguan bank account is not a bad thing. So opening one here could make sense, but for the majority of you, no, you do not need a Nicaraguan bank account. Even if you're gonna live here long-term, if you're an expat and you become permanent, you certainly, the longer you're here, the more likely you are to want one, but at no point do I expect you would ever run into a situation where you had to have one. It would just eventually become a little little bit less of a nuisance to have one because there are some things you can do in country like direct deposits from your cell phone right to someone else's account you like you kind of like Venmo inside the country we do this all the time if you don't have a bank account you just go to the corner store to do it but if you have a bank account you can do it from your phone that's really nice so that might be a feature that you want to use but you don't generally have to I'm looking at being an expat in Nicaragua where do I want to live so I can be around all the other expats Okay, so if you want to live in what we call the enclave lifestyle, that is where you're surrounded by expats like yourself, probably who speak English, so you have that shared experience. A lot of people are looking for that, and that makes sense. You want to have some of the safety and the cost and weather advantages of Nicaragua, but maybe you don't speak Spanish or you don't have a strong interest in Nicaraguan culture, but it has enough advantages that you would like to live here. So you want to live around people at least that speak your own language, if not have a lot more of your shared background. And that makes total sense and it applies to a lot of people, which is why there's large areas where you can do this. Number one is San Juan del Sur. That is the fishing village turned resort area in the southwestern coast on the Pacific, very close to the Costa Rican border. That is practically a English-speaking American and Canadian enclave. You will find loads and loads of gated developments and places where extra and heroes or foreigners are expected to live, and it is absolutely loaded with them. You go to restaurants, anywhere you go, you're going to run into foreigners far more than you're going to run into Nicaraguans. You're never completely isolated from Nicaraguans unless you live in a gated community that has its own restaurants and stuff, then of course you are, but you have um, a very, very inclusive enclave-like living experience while still having a certain amount of access to Nicaragua, and the prices don't get too bad, but it is the highest prices in the country by far. There is a region around San Juan del Sur that sprawls out mostly along the beaches that is loaded with foreigners as well. So all those areas you can be in a foreigner dominated area but not necessarily in an enclave or a gated community. You could have a farm or a small house in the middle of the country and just be nearby to an awful lot of foreigners who may be living there. So your mileage are various to where what you want, but San Juan del Sur is the epicenter of foreigners here in the country. On the island of Ometepe, there are a few places like Balway that have an awful lot of foreigners. Typically, this is these are hippie communes, so you're looking at a very different type of community, but there are groups on there, and a lot of people do gravitate towards Ometepe because they think island living will be a lot of fun. I think a lot also then gravitate at moving away because they discover that island living can be very limiting, but if it's the right thing for you, it's pretty much unbeatable. Ometepe is a completely unique living experience, and you're not going to find that basically anywhere else in the world. So if that's what you're looking for, Nicaragua may be providing it for you. And that's pretty amazing right there. I love Ometepe, but I wouldn't choose it as my main living uh, location as a first choice for sure, personally. But I know some people who do it and they absolutely love it. You can always take a ferry back to the mainland and do other things and then just go back home to Ometepe. So it's not like you're completely isolated, but when the storms hit or whatever and the ferry stop running or it just gets late at night and you have that feeling like, I really wish I could go out somewhere, you're on an island. It is a big island but it's still an island. The city of Granada is your biggest enclave-like city. Now, it's a real city, so it's full of Nicaraguans who live there normally, but there's a lot of foreigners, both tourists and expats, who are living there. And that means that you always have a lot of foreigners to go hang out with. And there are whole regions of the city, especially in the center, that are dedicated to tourist activities and housing for the foreigners. So restaurant strips and, and clubs and things like that, uh, you're going to find that 
most uh, expats who are looking for a city to live in find it very comfortable. It's a little bit more expensive than most of Nicaragua, but not dramatically so. Not like San Juan del Sur, but you're definitely going to notice that like restaurant prices and rents are going to be noticeably higher than in most of the country. But you get a lot for it, so a lot of people don't mind paying the extra. It's already a very affordable country, so Granada can be a great choice. And that is where I started my journey in Nicaragua, so I totally appreciate why people may want to live there. However, I would say for a lot of people who are looking at moving to a new country, you may start wanting an enclave-like experience and then over time may find that that is not what you want to keep having. So I would encourage you to consider, as I always do, rent instead of buy, especially if you're going to be in an enclave, because you may find that once you've been here for a little while, that the areas that are more Nicaraguan and less enclave start to become more comfortable and uh, uh, familiar. And you may be like, why am I paying extra to live in the enclave? I'm perfectly happy not being in the enclave areas. And so places like Granada or San Juan del Sur may become cost premiums that you end up sorry that you're paying once you're past the need for it. Now, if you're looking for communities where you're really getting into Nicaraguan culture and you're living like a Nicaraguan, but you can still find foreigners, this, I feel, is often the best mix. And the places that you're going to have this most strongly are in Managua itself and in Leon, which is where I'm recording right now. These cities are larger cities than Granada by significant amounts and have lots and lots of their own culture and, and history and activities. And the fact that a fair number of foreigners decide to live there kind of goes unnoticed. Leon is a little bit more noticeable than Managua. Managua technically will have more, but it's such a larger city that you see them a bit less. Although if you're going to certain areas like the Metro Centro, you're more likely to see them than in just random parts of the city. But the same thing happens in Leon. If you go out and hang out in the barrio, like where we are now, you're never going to run into a foreigner. It would be really amazing if you did. And if you do, it's almost certainly me. But if you're in Managua, there's tons of the city where you'll never see a foreigner, but bits where you'll see them all the time. And that's normal, uh, but those cities tend to be very good mixes where if you ever have that urge to go talk in English for an evening, you probably know someone and can go do so. But if you want to integrate into Nicaraguan culture by and large, you are able to do so and you don't feel like you're somehow isolating yourself. So those are great choices. Heading up into the mountains are a lot of other cities. And around the country, you have a lot of options. Uh, Matagalpa and Esteli really stand out as places that are even fewer uh, foreigners and extremely few tourists, but have just enough infrastructure that you're probably going to feel comfortable there. You start getting up to like Hinotega or Chinandega, and you start to get cities where there's practically no foreigners, and you'll really stand out. You can still get to other cities pretty easily, and they're still wonderful places to live, so I'm not recommending against them in any way. But if the thing that you're looking for is to be around other other foreigners at least part of the time, you may find that living in those places that you feel like the only one, and in some cases, you may actually be the only one. If you keep going further afield to Boaco or uh, Huigalpa, you easily are going to end up so isolated that you feel like you've gone to another planet. But that may be what you're looking for. So there's a general blend throughout the country, as there is in any tourist country. You can be in places that are full of tourists and places that have practically none. But San Juan del Sur, Granada, to some degree, Ometepe stand as one tier where you're going to be surrounded by people speaking English and, and doing uh, non Nicaraguan activities. There's going to be lots and lots of cultural events that are not Nicaraguan all the time. And then you have the Managua Leon tier where you have a really good blend of the two and they're more cosmopolitan. And then you're going to have all the other cities. Basically, the larger the cities, with the exception of Chinandega, the more likely they are to have foreigners in them. And then Chinandega and the smaller cities uh, typically have right about none. You're going to find that being there, sure, I'm sure you'll get to know somebody, but often it's someone who married someone from there and is living very much as a Nicaraguan and not someone who's looking for uh, other people to speak English or whatever. Or they may be very thankful to find someone as it's their only opportunity. So those are the places that you probably want to look at. What kind of budget do I need to live in Nicaragua? So this is a loaded question because everyone has different levels of what they're looking for for living, but let's talk about it because we'll come up with something at least. What we generally find is if you were for some reason stuck with a budget of only $800 per month, you could probably live in Nicaragua, but you may struggle to qualify for your residency. So while you could live on an $800 budget, if it's a challenge, you could live on a $200 budget. It would really be rough, but if you had to do it, you could pull it off. The local minimum wage is actually just under $200 a month, and people do live on that. They don't live well, it is extremely difficult, but if 
it was a, you know, win a million dollars, if you do this for a year, yeah, you could pull it off. It would be a really rough year, but you'd have a million dollars at the end of it, so maybe it's worth it. But for normal living to any degree, as a foreigner, because you will not get some of the discounts that Nicaraguans do, and you don't get some of the assistance that they do, you are going to want at least $800 a month. Now, you're going to need to be able to show greater than that for your residency, if you're going to stay here long enough to qualify, or be pushed into residency, but if you want to be able to earn that money and put a little bit away and you only want to spend $800 a month, you'll be able to do that without too much of a problem. Sure, you've got to tighten your belt a little bit. You do have to be careful, but doable it is. So that's not a bad uh, option. If you are going to be more in the $1,200 per month, you start getting to the point where it's reasonably comfortable. It's not bad at all. And this is for a single person. If you're going to be a couple, you don't need to double that, right? Of course, most places that you're going to rent are going to be at least one bedroom, not a studio. And so if you're, once you're getting into like a normal apartment, often you're getting two bedrooms. Most of the places that we look at, whether they're small houses or small apartments, actually have two bedrooms and one bath. That's a really common configuration here. And because of that, it's actually easy to be you know, you and a roommate or you and a spouse or a significant other and split rent and maybe split utilities and a few things. And suddenly having maybe $1,600 for two people is very doable. So it all depends on your situation, but you can definitely make that work. If you have much closer to $2,000 a month, you start getting into very, very comfortable living. And we once did an episode on a budget of $3,700 per month and really consider that to be at that point, you're, you're certainly into well affluent living. You're not going to be in the absolute most resorty places. There's still going to be some things you can't do, but in general, you're going to be living extremely well. Your purchase power parity here is more than 200% that of the United States. So, and you also, if you have income from the outside that is not taxed, if you're like an American living here as an expat full time, then you don't pay those U.S. taxes. That roughly, depending on how much you make, can do as much as quadrupling your income effectively. And so if you were making, say, $25,000 a year and you're doing that here, that becomes living like you're making $100,000 in the United States. That's not going to, as you know, if, if you're coming from the United States, it's not going to make you affluent, but it does make you comfortable. And so, yeah, that, that's kind of how it works here. It's going to be somewhere around there. We actually think it's a little bit more than 400%. In most cases, living here at $25,000 a year isn't too bad. But certainly living here at like thirty-six dollars to $40,000 a year is very comfortable. So just kind of a, a rule of thumb to work from, but the things that you like to do, the activities you want to do, do you really want to own a big, expensive, brand new truck? Do you want a really big home? Or do you want to be able to live in a small apartment and do things very affordably? It really depends on your lifestyle and your activities. So everyone has completely different budget needs, but for an awful lot of people, these are kind of the numbers we work from. And it's just good to know that uh, the minimum houses that we've seen here in country, about $84 a month to rent, and getting a house for about $145 for a really bare uh, two-bedroom house is doable. And once you start paying closer to $200, you're getting quite comfortable houses, sometimes even in gated, guarded communities. So those are good ballpark numbers. None of that is furnished, of course but it gives you an idea of you can get into pretty decent living, nothing fancy, this is Nicaragua, we don't tend to have the same style of houses as even Costa Rica or the United States, so it is important to understand what type of structures you're gonna be looking at, so you're not disappointed or shocked, but they can be comfortable and safe and in really nice communities and very attractive, uh, so it's worth, it's worth taking a look and understanding what real estate can look like here. I hear that Nicaragua's hot, how hot is it? And do I have to have air conditioning all the time? Well, you're right. Nicaragua is a very hot country. It is the hottest of the Central American countries and the hottest in the region and one of the hottest in all of Latin America and one of the warmest in all of the Western Hemisphere. So it's hot. Let's just be, let's be honest. It's a hot country. We're basically the same as Panama. Costa Rica in between us is much cooler. Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala to the north of us, all much cooler. Nicaragua and Panama stand out as being extraordinarily hot across the entirety of the countries. There are some areas up in the mountains that get a little bit cooler for sure, but they don't get a lot cooler. You're not talking about cold places. You're only talking about taking the edge off places. Now, depending on where you are in the country, there are some variations. If you're in like Hinotepe, in the mid cities, it's relatively mild compared to the rest of the country. Managua is a little bit warmer than that. Leon, a little bit warmer than that. And Chinandega, even warmer than that. So it depends where you want to be and you can adjust. But the, the differences between those cities is generally pretty small, just a degree or two. But when it comes to an average throughout the year, having a two degrees cooler, will be something that you notice in many cases. Here in Leon, we're the second hottest city in the country, and it is quite warm. And when you're in Managua and you say that you live in Leon, they do say, 
you know it's really hot, right? And you're like, yes, yes, I've noticed. <laughs> it is a very warm place, but it is equal temperatures all year round. It really doesn't have a strong seasonal change of temperature, and the winter and summer are flipped. See my episodes about seasons here in Nicaragua. We have a rainy season and a dry season. The dry season is technically the cooler one, but the rainy one has the cooling rains, and so we tend to feel like it's cooler, so we refer to that as the winter, and the dry season is the summer, even though the temperatures don't really match up, but it kind of mentally feels that way. But we have extremely little variation throughout the year. This is important because if you actually live here as an expat and you aren't traveling to cold locations and you only travel to hot locations that are similar in temperature or for brief periods of time, you will acclimate. And because it's even year round, that acclimation actually works really well. So for a lot of people, once you've been here between two and six months, and trust me, it leans more towards the six months than the two months, your blood and your body will adjust and start to see the temperatures here as relatively reasonable. The will always feel warm, don't get me wrong, and especially if you're coming from like me. I'm from New York, I'm used to the snow, I'm used to quite cold. This is always going to feel warm, but when we first got here three years ago, it was unbearable because it was just warm all the time. But after six months, we started noticing that we were able to go out, and after a year or two, we really noticed that we felt really comfortable at temperatures we would never imagine would be comfortable. That we can go out and wear jeans at 90 degrees seems unthinkable, but it's only unthinkable because in places like the United States, you rarely get even temperatures year round. So when you hit 90 degrees, it's always a warm day compared to the days around it. But here, 90 degrees is a normal day. And so over time, your body starts to adjust to that. And sure, on days when we hit high 90s, we feel really warm. But on days when we hit the low 80s, we actually start to feel chilly. And if we have a night that drops into the 70s, it's it's actually cold. And if it rains when it's in the low 80s, we've seen locals have to put on coats and bundle themselves in blankets. They don't know how to handle how cold it is. And it's still in the high 70s, low 80s. So for people who are new to Nicaragua, chances are you're going to want air conditioning, especially if you're in Chinandega or Leon or maybe Managua. These are the hottest cities, so they are going to have the biggest need for air conditioning, and they're the hottest year round. So especially if you're new and in those warmer cities, the air conditioning is going to be important, at least for a while. Once you've lived here for a while, it depends if you're in the city center or I'm out a little bit in a barrio, here there's enough air that, except for when I'm sitting at my desk working on a computer, have to have the windows closed, have to have headsets on, then I get so warm, especially if the sun is beating into my office, that I need to have air conditioning. But other than that, I pretty much year-round could sleep without air conditioning. I often do just because it's easier and, and it's convenient to have it dry and you don't have to worry about bugs coming in. But it's it's nice to know that the fresh air is often so cool that you could easily sleep in it, especially in Managua and any city colder than Managua, you're pretty much good for sleeping for most people without air conditioning. Maybe not in your first three months, but past that point, you're pretty good. Well, if you're in Chinandega, you may always want air conditioning. It really is just that much warmer. Here in Leon though, we really do notice that even right now, it's extremely comfortable. If I was looking to sleep right now, it would be absolutely fine. I wouldn't need uh, air conditioning or anything. And it is currently our summer. This is this is the warm time uh, and it's it's really not bad. So believe it or not, you actually don't need air conditioning that much in Nicaragua once you've acclimated. But if you just come to visit, you are certainly going to feel the heat, and that's what shocks people. They get this hit of heat. It's different than wherever they came from. They're not expecting it. They're not prepared for it. Their body doesn't like it, and they don't have an opportunity to give their bodies enough time to adjust, and that leaves them with a feeling that it's really hot here when it's not. And we'll also mention that a lot of people think that it's humid here in Nicaragua, and while it's not dry, it is not humid at all. It is drier than much of the U.S. Midwest, which is a moderately dry area. So we're not a desert by any stretch, but we are not a humid location here on the Pacific coast where the majority of the population is and all the major cities. So like here in Leon is actually drier than Dallas, Texas, which is a moderately dry city. It's not a desert city that would be drier. It's certainly not Phoenix, but when we say it's 90 degrees here and people say, yeah, but it's got a feels like of 110. No, it's actually, we're 90 and have a feels like 88 which is still pretty warm, but once you adjust to it, it's really not bad. And as your body gets better and better at dealing with the heat, the fact that it's a little bit dry, that we have nice breezes, actually keeps you pretty cool. There's days, even now in the middle of the summer, that I'm out walking well into the high 90s. We have a good breeze going on and I'm perfectly comfortable, which is not something I would ever expect having grown up in New York and being used to being able to go out in, outside in shorts in 40 something degrees. It's the tropics, so you get a lot of bugs there, right? And I've heard the mosquitoes are terrible. 
Well, it's a big country, so you're going to have areas that are more infested with bugs and areas that are less. But in general, and I come from places like New York and Canada and South Carolina and Georgia and Texas and Michigan, I've lived all over. And one thing that I can definitely say is of all the places in the U.S. that I've lived, when you compare it to Nicaragua, Nicaragua has fewer bugs in all the places that I've lived. That's pretty much anecdotal, but it is useful to know. Now, if I've, I've also lived in Europe, and in Europe there were fewer bugs than here. So it's definitely not the best for bugs, And the, but the bugs that we get here tend to be more like gnats, which I have some flying around right now as I say this, but they're not too bad. And mosquitoes are actually surprisingly few, considering it's an area where everyone talks about mosquitoes all the time. There are mosquitoes, don't get me wrong, but there's not as many as we had in Texas by any stretch. And I lived in a mosquito low area of Texas, and it's not even close to the mosquitoes we had in New York, for example. So it's very different. And different enough that in New York and Texas, if we were to open the windows, which people typically didn't, you would always, always have screens on them year round. But here in Nicaragua, the majority of houses and by majority, I mean over 99% do not have screens at all. And in the very few houses that I've ever been in that do have screens, they are limited to only certain rooms, not general to the whole house. Many times the middle of the house is just open depending on the design you have. But even the one that I'm at now, even though it's an enclosed uh, security roof, it still has open air and any mosquitoes or bugs could just come right in if there were enough to do that. But in reality, there aren't that many. Now, you do have to take some precautions, and the country is very serious about mosquito prevention. So they're constantly out trying to find ways to eradicate mosquitoes because mosquitoes do carry disease. So it's good to get rid of them. They don't want diseases spreading from the south or the north. We do have endemic diseases here, such as chikungunya and um, um, dengue fever. But those tend to not be that bad. I know they sound bad, and when you look them up on Wikipedia, you're like, wow, these sound really awful. But having had them... They're unpleasant, but uh, nothing that I would be particularly worried about. Malaria, they take very seriously, and I've never heard of there being an outbreak of malaria down here. You do want to be aware that it could happen, but it's not the huge deal. There is a lot of ways uh, to treat it. They are prepared to treat things here and do a good job of that as well, but they lean very heavily towards prevention, unlike in the north where they have a tendency to just treat you in the hospital after they've not bothered preventing it. And so things like Zika and West Nile uh, suddenly take over where they didn't have it before. Here, the things are dying out rather than growing. So in general, it's really not that bad. And just everybody lives in the open air all the time. And yes, that does mean you're putting more off on or whatever. You may be burning a little bit more candles. People do put in a little bit of effort to keeping the mosquitoes away, but mostly there just aren't that many mosquitoes. But your mileage will vary. We can live in one piece of the beach and go just, you know, a, a one mile walk down and one spot will be swarming with mosquitoes and one place will have none. Now that's the same as anywhere, so that's to be assumed, but I don't want to say Nicaragua doesn't have a lot of bugs. Certainly some pieces of it do, but in general, the places you are likely to live and just on average, it's going to have bugs, but it's not going to have huge numbers of bugs, especially mosquitoes like you're imagining, to the point where just about everyone is happy living with their windows open all day long and no screens. That really is a major change in lifestyle. It does mean that rather than getting mosquitoes as intruders to our house, what we actually get quite often is cats. Can you get a license to own a gun in Nicaragua? I don't know the definitive answer to this, but we just answered this one at length recently, and the answer is no. There was a time when you could, so you may hear a lot of stories from people who say, no, I, I know people who've had a gun in Nicaragua. Sure, like everything, there was a time when a lot of people churned butter in America too, but that is not the way it is now. The law has changed, and a number of years ago, uh, gun ownership was heavily restricted or eliminated. That's where I'm not completely clear if it was just restricted to the point where it seems like it was eliminated or if it was truly eliminated, but they did go, just like in England, they they had an event and then they went around and collected all the guns and eliminated gun ownership as a thing um, all around uh, all around the country. So even people who had the most likely ability to own a gun or right to own a gun, people who are professional marksmen, um, very well recognized, very well publicized, uh, absolutely just for sport, they were unable to keep their guns. So people who are less likely to be able to keep them, people who are wanting to do it for hunting or protection, those are specific things that if you were to say, well, that's why you want it. Even if gun ownership was legal, if you said you wanted it for those reasons, that would remove your right or your ability to get a license, even if you otherwise could. If you could have it as a, as a marksman, you wouldn't be able to say those things. So um, the reasons that people typically want them uh, are, are not reasons that you're allowed to have one under any circumstance. So for all intents and purposes, no, you cannot have guns here in the country. You may be able to find a law that says that maybe under very specific circumstances, but in practice, I believe you would find that it is 
impossible to have a gun, especially as a foreigner. Even citizens really can't have them.